So here we have it. The man of the hour. He's been in the NFL over 10 years. He was selected as an all-time pro ball five times. He made the Steelers Hall of Fame. He made the Steelers of Honor. Please welcome Greg Avoid Lloyd in the house, baby. How are you? Good, man. Good to see you, bud. You know, Greg, I'll tell you, when I met you, I'll be honest, I didn't know who you were at first, right? And then when Lawrence Davis and John Anthony said, Eddie, Google his highlights right now, man. I was like, holy shit. Okay, this guy is no joke, man. This guy is is unreal, man. Greg, I want to turn back the clock a little bit, all right? Going through your childhood, I read on Wikipedia your mom literally just dumped you with your five siblings at your aunt's house from Miami to Georgia? Correct. Um, I was two years old, and I'm assuming since I was born in 65, this was in 1967. And um, what, you know, little recollection that you could have as a two-year-old uh, of what was happening and what was going on, you know, I got filled in by my older siblings. I'm the youngest of nine. There's five girls, four boys, all still living, almost all of us, almost 60 years old. But yeah, it was one night. Um, the story goes, it was one night um, we got dropped off at my aunt's house. And my aunt was living in a little town called Fort Valley, which is where I obviously went up and went to grew up and went to school and everything. And uh, we were living in a small, she was living in a small apartment on the corner, two bedroom. She already had... Um, six kids i think three of them may have been already out of the house and maybe two were still there one was in college and now all of a sudden she's got um she's got um six more and um it was um like you said okay let me get let me get you back buddy i don't know what happened here that's what happened there you go there you go but um Anyway, the, the story goes that that's that's what happens. I don't know the reason behind it. And um, I think the next time I saw my mom, I was 12. And um, she stopped by. We had moved basically down the street into a house. And she stopped by. And my mom, my aunt said to me, you know, that's your mom. And, um, you know, there was no conversation. And the, and the sad part about it uh, is that... Um, at 58 years old, my mom has passed away. My aunt's passed away, and there was never any, there was never any resolution. There was never any a why. You know, I was raised by my aunt, and she was like she. We were never to speak anything evil. She never spoke anything evil or ill will of her. And it was almost as if there was a mental issue. Maybe there was a mental issue. Maybe she gave it to me, but it turned out. <laughs> showed up on a football field so but um i think there was a little issue and um i'm grateful honestly i'm grateful that she did what she did i'm, I'm grateful that she had the fortitude to know that she could not do a good job of raising us and send us a place where you know we could be raised and uh i just had my 40 you see me wearing this shirt i just had my 40th high school class reunion and part of that, talking to those classmates, they didn't understand any of that. A lot of them, like, Greg, we read your bio when you were in the league. So we, we didn't know. But they picked on me. You know, they picked on me and because, you know, I didn't know we was poor. I didn't. And because we had, you know, we were happy. We had three meals. But I knew that when I went to school and on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I had the same school. I had the same clothes on. I had the same clothes on on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We changed, you know, and then Thursday, Friday, we the same thing in school. You get picked on. Well, you know, if you don't want to get picked on, you can do one or two things. You can fight, which is never a solution, not even back then. Or you have to be really good in class or really good in sports and at that point i was both so it took a little bit of pressure off but you still had people who did that but um like i said that's 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 what happened my sisters and them have never 
said anything different. And then growing up and becoming, you know, who, you know, this football player, I introduced my children to their mom, my grand, you know, their grandma and my mom. And kind of like me, she really didn't have anything to do with it. She, she, you know, she didn't have anything to do with them. And it's like, at some point in your life, you have to say, you know what? I've done. I've done what I'm supposed to do. I'm never going to be disrespectful. Never have been disrespectful to her. But guess what? I don't have to do. I don't have to keep getting my feelings hurt. I don't have to keep feeling like this. And so I just, you know, if we were somewhere and she was there, I would come in the room and give her a hug, give her a kiss. And that was pretty much all I had for her. You know, and you know, and the sad part about it, I know my brother and sister kind of got upset with me about it, but when my mom passed away, I didn't go to the funeral. And it was like, I felt like I was going to a funeral of a stranger. And, I was, you know, it would be, it, I, I wouldn't feel right going there. And I had no feelings. I don't know if you know what that means, but I had zero feelings. Well, you know, when, yeah. when, they took, when, they, when I was told, that she passed away, it was like, if it was probably you and your mom, if you got a good relationship, you're probably going, man, you know, I'm feeling some kind of way. I had no feelings. Yeah. And you know, so, the, the thing about me, I, I kind of relate because my father left me when I was four years old. Right, and right. I don't know where he's at, right? And let's just say, all right, he passed away. I wouldn't come to the funeral either because I, I don't have feelings for him. I mean, where I, were you when I needed you, man? You know what absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. But, um, you know, I, I tell you this, man. My aunt, Miss Bertha May Rump, that's her name. She raised me. She whooped my butt. She made me. She had a third grade education. She grew up during that time where, you know, you were indentured servants and you could work or share sharecroppers. You could you could live on the land. You didn't own the land and work the land. And as long as you worked the land, you had a place to live in. And I think she had enough of it. But she had a third grade education, man. And um, she wouldn't allow us to bring seeds home. If you brought a seed home on your report card, that was the end of sports and a butt whooping to go on top of that. You weren't allowed to talk back. If the teacher said you did it, you did it. If an adult down the street said you did it, you did it. You know, and that was it. And so she instilled that in me. So a lot of discipline, you know, and everything, you know. And uh, I guess even with my own kids, there were some things that she did were a bit harsh. And uh, I, you know, like 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 anything in life, you take the good, and then you're like, oh, I wouldn't do that, you know, you know, it's like that's that's a little much. But I gave my kids, and I think I did. I think I gave them all the discipline that I had, and all the discipline that she gave me. And it's it's you know, some people look at it and say, hey, man, that's that's tough. Well, sometimes you have to have tough love. You meet people where they are, you know. And so that's what it, that's what she did with us, and that's what I did. And. Uh, Hey, man, I tell you what, I didn't turn out that bad. How many, exactly, how many uh, of you lived in that house in Georgia? And how big was it? Well, I tell you what, you know, and this is like, you know, I think once, I, I'm pretty sure we were all on, uh, what do you call it? We were all getting help from, from um, I can't remember think of the name of it. But anyway, we were getting help from the state. And so I think, welfare, right? I was on thank it you. too. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. I, think I was we're getting, on it. I was I on it. Say it. But yeah. see, my CRS will kick in every, every now and again, and you know what that means, right? I can't remember, and you can fill in the blanks here, but I can't remember the, the poop, but it's the, it's the other word. But um, yeah, I think I think once the state realized that she was taken care of, then the state came in, it was a bunch of money, we was on welfare and food stamp, and I think she was able to buy a house, you know, and stuff like that. So in that house, it was so fun. In that house, you had, of course, the matriarch, my aunt, and then she had two kids there, and then one of her daughters had a son there, and then there's six of us. And then when she had her kids come home for holidays or anything like that, you, know, you almost got, I mean, that's, that's 10 people living in a, Three bedroom house with two bathrooms and stuff. So again, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't. It was a brick house, so we didn't, we didn't know, and we didn't think that we were poor. Talking about poor, I mean, you know, we were a lot well off than a lot of people that I knew, but we weren't allowed to compare. We weren't allowed to be 
mean or anything like that. But it wasn't until I went to a few of my friends' house and they had their own rooms and they had cable cable television and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, it, it was like, okay, we we we're we're, we're we're poor, you know, and stuff like that. But it wasn't. It was it, inside, inside. You know, that's how you felt. But on the outside, man, it was like you still got to go compete. You still got to make good grades. You still got to be a good student. You still got to be a good person. All of those things were, you know, were in there. And uh, so, sports was one of the ways for me. And I played baseball. And most of my most of my friends that are my friends that I grew up with would tell you that I was a better baseball player than I was a football player. Wait, all of them thought I was... A minute. No way. That's impossible. I'm going to tell you, all of them would tell you that they thought I was going to play baseball as opposed to as opposed to football. <laughs> Absolutely. So, 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 but football was for me, and I chose it because I was, I was angry. I was angry because, like I said, I would go to play rec ball and... You got if you got kids or nephews or anything, you go to a game. What are you doing? You're yelling, even if they are doing the simplest, stupidest stuff. You're still yelling for them. Yeah, I so know. I would go to these games, and I probably was at some point one of the best players, and not the best player on the field. But nobody's screaming my name. Nobody's calling me. Nobody's you know, hey, way to go, Greg. You know, way to thing. But I can always hear somebody going, "Come on, Johnny." Hey, let's go, Johnny. You know, and you know, stuff like this. And, you know, stuff. And I'll be looking around like, who is this Johnny? Because if I find him, I'm gonna hurt him. <laughs> and, but 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 I know it's kind of dark and kind of sick. But it was that. That's what I wanted. You know. And see, it was that missing that mom thing. My aunt, and I love her to death, and I love her, and she is past, and I love. But my aunt never told me she loved me. Never? Never. Never. I've never heard her say, and never heard her say, I love you. It was more of a, I put food in your mouth, I got a roof over your head, wash your clothes. That that was it. And so I had to, like I say, when I get my own family, I had to change. I could not, I did not want my kids that way. And I know people think it was, but like my boys, you know, and, you know, my boys, and we're a little estranged right now because, you know, they, they got different opinions than me and about stuff. But younger and growing up and being in my household and dropping them off to do something in the morning, oh, I'm kissing them. I kiss them dead in their mouth. No, daddy loves you. Daddy loves you. My daughter right now calls me and it's like, you know, hey, daddy loves you. You know, don't forget daddy loves And so I never heard that, you know, and it was... um it was, you know, it was something that you wanted. It was something you longed for, you know, because it was like, if, if somebody says to me that they love me and that it, I think I could have even done more, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think I could have done more. But um, dealing with the circumstances, man, like I say, you know, you had to put feelings aside. You had to put going places aside that you wanted to go and things of that nature. And I just, again, you know, to keep people from, meddling, picking, you know, whatever they call it these days, you know, back then that's what we call it. But to keep people from doing that, I, I, I became this person who was a good student and who was, uh, you know, we were, we were, I say that we were forced to go to Sunday school and church every Sunday, even though the people that was forcing us to go didn't go. And after a while, you, you believe that that, it rubbed off. I mean, when I was my, my I, I got a buddy of mine that played linebacker with me in college, and he tells me he said, "Great, you know what's impressing me most about you?" He said, it had "Nothing to do with all the other stuff that you did." He said, "But I watched you on Sunday morning get up and walk to church and come back." He said, "To this day, every time we have a conversation, that's what you still talk about." But see, people know number ninety-five, and they go, "There's no way that guy." could know God because he's, you know, he's doing this and he's doing that. But I tell you what, man, if it wasn't for the relationship and the faith that I had, you know, and have, you know, in Christ, and it's gotten better and it's getting better, and I'm flawed. I'll be the first one to tell you I'm flawed. I'm by no means a pastor or anything, but I'm flawed. 
but it's to wake up every day knowing that he loves me. Right. And I didn't, I, I didn't understand that as a kid. If I had a new, known that as a kid, if somebody had said, you know, even if your mom or your aunt's not saying it, Jesus loves you. And I had to learn that as an adult. And so to wake up every day knowing that Christ loves me, it's like I know people now go, man, you're nice now. You're nice now. And it's like a lot of the darkness is gone. A lot of the the, the, the stuff that I was dealing with. I mean, I, I, I thank the NFL PA and NFL for putting in place um, us being able to go and talk to therapists. I, I, I'm not ashamed. I've been in therapy for three, four years, and it probably kept me from either killing myself or killing somebody. And uh, it works. It works to be able to talk things out, man. And like I said, I, 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 you know, there's a dark side of me. And when I, when I get there, I'm usually I, I have to be by myself, you know. And sometimes that's not good. But all of that, you know, coming full circle, it's like if you had to write an autobiography. You know, everybody wants to hear the good stuff, but it's not an autobiography if the bad stuff's not in there. Yeah, and so, yeah. and that's what makes, I think that's what makes people human. When, you know, you never want to, if you, if you ever pick up an autobiography and all you're reading is good stuff, put it down because it's a lie. You know, right. that's me, man. I mean, I've got a lot of, you know, I've been divorced twice and I've done all that stuff. And, you know, you say, I could sit here and say it wasn't my fault, but I'm pretty sure I had something to do. I set my role in it. But, um, I have no, I have no ill feelings with nobody. I don't. I have any. I wish everybody well. I wish everybody, all my brothers and sisters. You know, I love them. And like I said, even though we have difference of opinions about things, but I love them. You know, I, I, I honestly love them. But it's an agape love. It's a good. It's an unconditional love that they don't have to earn it. It's just something that I give them. And so that's how I am with my friends. That's how I'm with the people that I'm close to. And then people go well. How can you turn that off and turn that on when you play football? Well, totally different, totally different guys. Kind of like Clark Kent going into the phone booth when he comes out. He's Superman. You right. know, that's 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 what I did for a living. And it's like I understand that the other guys on the other side of the field, they 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 pray to God also. We also play to pray to the same God, hopefully. But uh, I actually believe when I put my uniform on that. I'm, 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 I'm the difference maker. And I think everybody that's ever played this game probably think that way. They think like, if I'm not on the field, we're going to lose. But if I'm on the field, oh, we're going to win. You have to have that mentality, but it doesn't come from a thinking. It comes from a doing, putting the work in, you know? You know, you know what I like? One of your quotes, you said that we have to work hard. Something totally forgot about this quote what you said we but the expectation now, expectation we work, right we work hard now it's like when you when you've done the work you have an expectation so when we played ball when you studied when you went out and you practiced the way we practiced we expected to win but if you hadn't done the work you're, you're hoping. hoping right you're hoping you're hoping and that's in any facet of anything you do in this world you know, you can't do what you do if you haven't done the work. If you haven't done your research, if you haven't done your stuff, you can't have this interview with me because you'll be all over the board trying to figure out, and I'll be like, nope, that's not right. But when you are thorough and when you make sure that you're thorough, then my job is to make sure that I'm thorough so that those other 10 guys I was on the field playing with, I don't ever want to be the weak link. I don't ever want them to look at me and think I'm that guy that they have to worry about. So... That being said, man, it's like that that was easy. That's the easy part. It's this thing called life. That's the hard part. The walking off the field and trying to be married and trying to, you know, maintain that, trying to maintain, you know, stuff with your kids, trying to maintain some kind of civility with your friends and and still be considered a good person, even when you just drop the F bomb after the AFC championship game, you know, you still have to be a good. And so I say this, man, we are a sum of a lot of our screw-ups. 
A lot of people think that we're, 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 you know, that they're self-made and they're good because of what they did that was good. A lot of people do good stuff. But I think we're a sum of our screw-ups, the least amount of screw-ups, or the more screw-ups you have and that you can correct. I think that makes you better, you know. When we're younger, we're taught you can't do it, you can't do it. And my thing to my kids is like, go out in this world and screw some stuff up. Because if you keep screwing it up, you figure out how to get it right. And once you get it right, you're on the road to success, you know. And that's that's kind of it in a nutshell, man. So, you know, putting God first in everything you do, you know, from, hey, I see you smoking cigar, you know, I'm a cigar guy. You know, what are you smoking? Cohiba, baby. Yeah, Cohiba. So it's like, you know, from choosing what kind of cigar I'm going to smoke to, you know, what I'm gonna, what shirt I'm going to put on. And, well, you know, Greg, I had I, some for you, but, you know, you're not here. You know, it's virtual. So <laughs> you know, well, you know, I tell you what. You hold me a couple of those. Hold me a couple of those, and we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll talk about that when we see each other. Man. Well, absolutely. But you know, Greg, I want to turn back the clock too. You know, when you played little league uh, football, well, I guess it's pee wee football and then little league baseball, right? And then when the game was over, you see these parents tell their kids, "Oh, I love you, baby. You did so good." Did you ever uh, notice that? And you say to yourself, "I wish I had that too." Well. I noticed it. I didn't probably internalize. I wish I had that. I just internalized. If anybody, if anybody came out here, whether it was brothers, sisters, cousins, or anybody came out here and just tapped me on my shoulder and said, hey, good job, man. You know, I love you. That would have been enough. But I, I can't say that I would, because it's almost like, I'm going to be honest with you. It was a jealousy. I, I was jealous because it was something that I was missing. And it was like, why is it that, like now, I am i don't need it. I don't need you to tell me. I don't need anybody to tell me, you know, whatever. Because, again, I told you, you know, I know who loves me. But then I needed it. I truly and I truly and I truly and I truly need it. I, I can't say the why behind it. I don't know what what was in me that said that I needed that. And that was something that was part of the, you know, of the recipe that was really, because I think, I, I really think that if I had gotten that, if I had gotten that early, I don't think I would have been the person that I, I, I you wouldn't be interviewing me right now. No way. Come on, man. You had passion, I'm, man. You were talented. I'm, I'm serious, man. I'm serious because I took it literally as a, it was, it was fire. It, it's my. This is my motivation now. My motivation now is that I'm going to prove to everybody that I am worthy. I'm worthy to be in the number. I'm worthy to be. Um, uh, um, I'm just worthy. You know, I can't put it in words how I want to put it in words, but I just want everybody to know that. Hey, look at me. I'm worthy. Don't look at me as the kid who wears his pants. Three days a week, look at me as I'm worthy. I, I, I work hard. I'm capable. Look at me as that. That you know, I'm just like you. I just don't. My parents just don't have what your parents have. But you're not better than me. And for the rest of my life, I'll be proving to you that you're not better than me. I mean, who wants to go around like that? But. If whatever motivation, motivation, you know, and like you say, you'll lose some friends and you'll lose some companions and you'll lose, you know, other people because people don't understand that you are a certain way. This is what drives you, you know. What drives me is 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 um, perfection. And I think if you talk to most guys who are have played any kind of ball or any kind of success, whether it's in the boardroom, at the banks, or anything, that's. That's that's the key. It's that it's that you want to be the best, and only way you can get to be the best is that you guys. When we was growing up, thank God we didn't have all these devices that are out there now. But it's so opposite because it was like now to punish a kid or to I won't say I guess I can use that word to punish a kid. You said go outside. Back then, when we were growing up, it was the opposite of that. Come inside because we wanted to stay outside till. So, so the sun went down. Exactly. And they had to come get us. And so that so it's a difference, you know, and that was the that was the thing. And so now 
as I started, you know, getting, I knew that I was, you know, I knew that I had some talent. I just didn't know on what level, you know. And it's like when you're playing a bunch of guys all the time, your teammates, the guys you see and stuff, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're getting the awards. You're getting this award and you're getting that award. And it's like it's good, but that ain't still are you as good as that guy that's over in California now that's playing. On. So, so even at that age, you start thinking like that. And so um, I got my feelings hurt when I came out of high school because I wanted to go to that school in Georgia they call Tech. And I'm going to say it like that. I'm going to put it together. But they ticked me off, man. I was the number two ranked. And I hate to say that. I hate saying that. I was the number two ranked linebacker in the state of Georgia. And not one D1 college came to get me. You know why? I was only wearing 200. I was weighing 213 pounds my senior year in college. I mean, my senior year in high school. But I was bench pressing like 335 pounds. So I was, I was always strong. But nobody came after me. And so... My uh, my college, my hometown college coach, Coach Doug Port, he came and charmed my aunt. And she was like, there it is. She came and charmed my aunt and was like, you know, when he left, she was like, yeah, I think you should, you know, you should go out there. And I'm looking at her and I'm going, you don't even know nothing about football. But here's the other thing, that, here's the other thing that right there, even that. She never went to one of my games. I played high school baseball, the high school baseball, anybody who sees this that's from Fort Valley knows me, the high school baseball field used to be right behind my house. Oh, wow. she, never, she never came to one game. She never came to watch me play one baseball game. She never came to watch me play one high school football game, not one college game, not one. Not one. Were you, were you, were you heard about that, Greg? Would they oh. really... It just again from 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 my mom now to my aunt not being present. It's like it's here. Everything is everything's right here, you know. And all somebody had to do now is say the wrong thing, and it's it's going to explode. And I can tell you this, man. I think I thank God that He put. Miss, I mean, uh, I'm gonna say it like this, and, I, and I don't, I, if I say it and people watch it, I don't want to miss nobody. But my best friend Alvin Hosey, his uh, dad, um, I used to hang around Alvin a lot, and his dad was Alvin. Tell his dad was Alvin. Say he was mean. I thought he was he was disciplined, and he worked on on the Air Force Base there. And his mom was a school teacher, and when I was with Alvin, they treated me like. I was their kid. So if they made Alvin do something, they made me do it. If Alvin had to go in and they sent me home, kind of thing. But Miss McCrary and my, my you know, from, from 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 high school, who was one of my teachers, Miss uh, uh, uh gosh, I'm thinking to see her face now, I can't call her name. But a lot of my teachers, and like I said, and if I, I, I hope people when you see this, please don't do it because my mind's not working so I can remember all these names. But all of my teachers that taught me in like grade school and middle school, guess where they all went? They all went to my church. Wow. So do you think you can act up in school on uh, Monday through Friday and then go to church on Sunday and see them talking to somebody and you'd be sitting there with your finger in your mouth going, mm, man, I hope they, you know, and you, you start thinking, I hope I do it. But they all had a big impact. They all had a big impact in my life. And um, there were a lot of people. There were a lot of people that went to Fort Valley State that I had as teachers who were saying, hey, Greg, you can go to Fort Valley State, man, and, you know, go graduate. You can play football, you can play a good level of football, go graduate. Nobody ever talked about the pros or nothing like that. It was just like, go graduate. You can do it right here at home. You know, you don't have to go to some junior college somewhere, but stay right here. And um, I, um, I didn't. I want to leave Georgia, man. I did. I want. I want to leave Georgia, but when Georgia Tech didn't give me a scholarship, then I was like, okay, well, I'm out of here. I'm going. I think I got a offer to go to some junior college in in, in California, and I was going to go. And then Mr. Hughley. 
God rest his soul, was my seventh grade, eighth grade PE teacher. Went to Fort Valley, and he said to me, you know, he had that voice. Everybody used to think I was his kid because we looked alike. And he just said to me, hey, man, you know, you can, you can, you can go to Fort Valley, and, you know, you're going to be all right. He said, it's a, it's a good place to go. And so from that moment on, I, I signed, I went out, and then, you know, four years later, I'm, I'm getting drafted by, by the Steelers, man. So put the work in, you know. Greg, when so no University of Georgia, no SEC schools, none of those guys recruited you. None, none. They had they 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 the the guy that was ranked number one in the state of Georgia, the Bulldogs gave him a scholarship. He played maybe I don't even think he played four years. I, mean, I don't think he started for him. I'm pretty sure he didn't start for him. But, you know, you heard me say this word. He was garbage. <laughs> <laughs> he now, was when, when you played at uh, Fort Valley State, did you play against Shannon Sharp when you were a senior? Because I'm looking, I was doing research, and I was seeing myself, he went to Savannah State. Yeah, He's a seventh, seventh rounder, you're a sixth rounder. And I'm like saying, listen, this Division II school is no yeah. joke. Devin was a um, freshman when I was a senior. Right. And we okay. Asked them and uh, we heard about him. They were talking about they got this, you know, kid over there. But talk to Shannon. He'll tell you. He'll tell you. He'll tell you real quick. He ain't do nothing against us. <laughs> <laughs> he, he talked. Now he can talk. He can talk. But against us, he couldn't do a thing. We we shut him down. Now against a lot of other teams that didn't have the defense that we had. Oh, he was a beast. That's why he's in the Hall of Fame. He was a beast. And um, probably, like me, probably should have been drafted a lot higher than a six and a seven round draft choice. But Shannon, was a, he was a beast, bro. No doubt about it. But, you know, that Division II conference that you guys were in, I mean, you had some good D2 programs as far as football. I mean, you had Moorhead. Moorhead, is that what it's called? Moorhead State? Morehouse. Morehouse. Morehouse, uh, Moorhead, right. Well, Moorhead State's there, yeah, but you got Morehouse College also. Right. And. I think the teams that we played against that were that were tough. We had, um, you know, people go, "Where's that?" But we played against Albany State as our rival, and it's 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 further south, Georgia. They were they were same colors as we, so always a rival when somebody's got your same color on. You know, they 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 profess to be the true blue and gold, and so it's like, okay, it's on. So even if you lost and you fought, and it's like we ain't gonna lose them both, you know, kind of thing. But Albany State was probably our, our rival, but we always had tough games against Tuskegee. And, uh, I mean, these are historical colleges. You think about the Tuskegee Airmen and all that. We played against Tuskegee, and uh, they, had, they had a decent team, but then we had what they called the AU Center. It's Clark, Morris Brown, and Morehouse right there in Atlanta. And, you know, if we didn't beat all three of them, we were we considered ourselves sorry because they didn't have good programs at the time. But we played them, and we beat up on them regularly. And everything, and then we went to Kentucky State and played them. And then I think the first year we went to the playoffs, and they, these guys are still dominant. And we went and played North Dakota State, and the game was four seven to seven for three quarters, and in the fourth quarter they won fourteen to seven. That's how. That's how. That's how. We had we had an incredible defense. We had an incredible defense. I can sit here and I can tell you, we had gentlemen, DeVal Callaway, and we had another guy we called uh, Wee Wee. Uh, uh, I can't think of his real name, but we called him Wee Wee. Between them guys right there, there's no way in the world, and I'm telling you, after playing 12 years in the league, I've never seen a better cover, better cover uh, corners than those two guys. He, these guys could have played Forever, they could have played forever. We had a nose, a uh, center, by the name of Julius Towns. Julius Towns, I promise you, was every bit of stuff. Six foot, he's probably about six foot two, maybe six foot three. Julius was probably two hundred and seventy-five pounds, but he probably had about five percent body fat on it. And he, before I met the money Dawson, was the first pulling center that I've ever seen in my life. 
I've ever seen in my life. He grabbed me and one of my defensive ends one day in a headlock, and we were looking at each other like, what you going to do? He looked at me like, what you guys do? We can't do nothing. That's how strong he was. But they never got an opportunity. And a lot of it was because of an AD. There's, there wasn't a good athletic director there to push these guys out. But I promise you, I played against centers. I played against this guy. I've seen this guy you know, play. I've lift weights with him. I haven't seen anything like it. I haven't seen I haven't seen anything like it. Those guys were those guys were for real. I mean if and they was at Fort Valley. Easily could have been at any any D one school anywhere and would have been they would have been freaks of nature. I don't know if you remember one of my one of my uh, I'll tell you how freaky it was, Eddie Anderson. You know the name. Went to Fort Valley State College, got drafted the year before I did by Seattle. Six round, I believe. Eddie Anderson I watched Eddie Anderson bench 405 pounds seven times. He ran a 4240 and was weighing about 200, maybe maybe about 215, 210 pounds. A freaking free safety, bro. Wow. That's that's what we had on our defense. Man, so what were these uh, the scouts? What were they thinking? I don't get it. Uh, good question. It's a good question. But I, I'm telling you. I if I and, and, and people when they see this and they go no way tell them man go back and I wish they can go back to archives and go to Fort Valley or go to a site and pick this up my my middle linebacker is my frat brother Andre Green Andre Green we call him Kazmaier now you remember what Kazmaier used to look like right mm -hmm. that's what it looked like I've never seen anything like that in my life Andre was probably the strongest guy on campus played middle linebacker for us and. Uh, I used to go watch him lift weights. Now, this is our weight. Our high school weight room was better than our college weight room. <laughs> you know? Oh, most definitely, bro. Most oh definitely. God. Our high school weight room. But it was like when the big guys got in there and started lifting, you had to wait for them to get through bench pressing so you could have weight so you can squat with and do other stuff with because they got all they have all the way. But these guys, man, were enormous. But that's what I came to. And I came to Fort Valley. I was again. I was probably about 215 pounds, and Coach Porter brought me out to um, meet the team doing. I think it was spring, right? And here I come out there, you know, a little tall, skinny kid, and he's like, "Hey guys, you know, I want to introduce you to one of you know guys going to be with us next year. He's already committed to us. He's a great Lord." And they say, "You know, you guys have seen him play over at the high school and da da da." <laughs> I'm looking around and I'm thinking to myself, where are the linebackers at? Where are the linebackers at? And when the linebackers started introducing themselves to me, here's what I felt like. Yeah, I felt like I was doing this. I was like, I was looking so, up like this right here. And I, and is, I, and it I like, is, is it like the scene in the movie Rocky IV when he goes up against the Russian and then Rocky's yes. looking at him like this? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And it was like, I go home. I go home and I tell my aunt, I said, I'm never going to play out there. And she, she's like, what are you talking I said, every one of those linebackers out there are twice my size. I said, I'm never going to play out there. And she just turned around and looked at me, and she said, well, you are going to have to figure it out. Whatever it is that they're doing, you're going to have to figure out whatever they, it is that they're doing. And I man, I was hot. I was so hot. I was like, man, there is no way. But... And again, I, I, I remember my, I think it was my, after my freshman year, my sophomore year, I could have walked home for, for um, I think it was like uh, winter break. I could have walked home. I was two miles away from my house. I stayed on campus. Coach Porter made stay on campus, and then he had the cafeteria open so we can get some food. Those guys, those big guys I was telling you about, was Lee Ingram, who ended up being my linebacker coach, uh, uh, Anthony Goodwin, we call him Amp, and um, uh, Julius Towns. I worked out with these guys, and I was look. I looked like I was their uh, butler. That's what I looked like. I looked like the butler in the group. And that one off season, that one little time, I, I started to get big, and they taught me how. But see, the thing about what we didn't do, what we didn't have in place there, we didn't have the conditioning coaches like they have you know places now to tell you you can't just lift you got to run too and so you know we had to do our own running 
and everything. But um, man, I mean, I I probably wouldn't have wouldn't, wouldn't wouldn't take it any other way. I think if I had to do it any other way, I wouldn't again. I mean, that jersey that you're wearing right now, somebody else's name would be on the back of it. Well, you know, Greg, let me tell you something, man. You put up numbers in college football, all right? I mean, you literally... Now, let me ask you this. Would these quarterbacks, running backs, tight ends, when they see you, were they scared shit when you were starting to put up numbers? Or they're like, oh, my God, this guy's going to kill me. Well, I, I, you know, everybody lines up and play. I, and I can tell you one thing that happened, and if I don't say it, I know the guys are going to kill me. You didn't say that. We're playing Alabama and them. Now, you know... Uh, John Stallworth. I played with John Stallworth, you know, with the Steelers. My 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 uh, rookie year, John Stallworth was in his last year, and uh, got to play with Donnie Shell and you know also. But uh, Stallworth, Alabama A and M alumni, alum great Hall of Fame and all that stuff. So we're playing Alabama A and M for homecoming for their homecoming. Alabama A and M had uh, oh gosh, so bad. I said I know we're gonna call his name. It, uh, uh, New England drafted it. Big old, New England. New England drafted it for Alabama. Big big uh, uh, offensive offensive uh, tackle. And I'm seeing his face. I can't call his name. And I went against him quite a few times. But I was chasing the play. I never saw him. <laughs> Them other ones that you never see. Those are the ones where you end up in the hospital. Fortunately, I didn't have to go to the hospital, but I did get knocked out. First concussion of my life. Wow. Out. I was out. You know? So I almost, someone I was, actually put you down? Hit me from, hit, me from, hit me from this side. I never saw him. I was running and chasing, and he came from blindside. I got blindside. I never saw it. I was, my eyes was on trying to catch the thing. But yeah, he knocked me. I almost wanted to say it was Richmond Well, but it wasn't well. Well went somewhere else. I'm trying to think of who it was. But yeah, that was I mean, it was a it was a black and blue division, man. It was tough. But um, you know, everybody showed up, man, when we got ready to play. Everybody knew. I don't think we were like we are now, where everybody goes, Oh, they got that guy over there and you gotta watch because our defense was just so magnanimous, man. It was like you didn't know where you didn't know you couldn't run. We used to we used to take pride. And I did the same thing when I got to the league. On that right side of the defense, it was like, if you guys score over here, if you guys try to run over here, first of all, we're going to be insulted. We're going to be insulted that you guys actually try to run over here. So we're not having it. We don't have any corners. Over, there's no corners for you to turn. Everything over here is an arc. So we don't, that's how we work. And so, but that's how we practice. And so I, I'm assuming that people were worried more about trying to catch a drag pass across the middle and we got that free safety that's running full two forward and Ben's pressing what he's been pressing. I watched Ed Anderson knock out two tight ends from Kentucky State back to back. They ran the same play. He knocked one out. They took him out. We did the little time to get him off the field. They came back and ran the same play. He knocked him out and I think they got they, they got the message there. But we had guys that could you know, that could do that. We had defensive linemen that were just, you know, these guys were different, man. They were different. Right, right. And I wouldn't tell them then, but I can say it now. I was scared of some of them. What? <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Oh. Greg Lloyd scared? Listen, no listen, way. Listen, no so, way. You, so you're talking about you're talking about Greg Lloyd that you know from ninety five Jersey you went. You're not talking about that little skinny kid in college. That That's little skinny true. kid. That's true. Okay. In college, hadn't you know he hadn't he hadn't gotten there yet. But some of these guys were, I mean, man, they were. Hey, listen, man, we had a guy go out and start shooting shooting pigeons to eat them, and he wasn't shooting them with a pellet gun. Big defensive lineman. Yeah, I'm scared of guys like that. Yeah, yeah, you would be too. I was scared of guys like that. <laughs> you know, especially when they stand over when they, when you see them and you got to look up at them like they're saying, "Yes, I was scared of guys like that." You know, oh when God. coaches. Tell the captains, don't you ever leave me in a room with this guy by myself. If the coach is scared of him, I have every right to be, you know. So yeah, but you know, man, it's it's part of it's part of, of of the journey, and all of that makes you, you know, you take all of that and then you take it to training camp. Now you think about this, though. Now think about this. That almost wasn't me. My first two years, 
both knees. I was a liability to the Steelers. Total reconstruction. Second day of training camp. Some tight end trying to make the team. I threw him going to make the tackle. Hit me in the back of my knee. Everything buckled. Totally well, hold on a minute before we get into that. All right. Okay. Is this yep. guy responsible for recruiting you with the Steelers? Oh, Bill Nunn. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because Bill I Nunn. heard about this guy. I did my research. You see, you like that, right? Am I doing good, Greg? You're doing very well. All right. Doing- because, you know, I did mega research. I talked to a lot of Steeler fans, and Absolutely. they were like, Eddie, this guy is special. Do you realize? I'm like, well, you know what? I'm going to do research. Yeah. Deep, I'm going to dig in. And I said to myself, now this guy was a, a, I guess he was writing for a black newspapers or something like that in Pittsburgh. I believe at the time he was writing for a black newspaper, SBN uh, Sports. Uh, and um, Bill came on and um, Bill was actually responsible for, even before me, he's responsible for, you got to think about this now. People don't, people don't get this. Pittsburgh Steelers have had Mel Blunt, South Carolina State, HBCU, Hall of Fame, John Stallworth, Alabama a and HBCU, Hall of Fame, Donnie Shell, South Carolina State, HBCU, Hall of Fame. Then you got L.C. Greenwood, you know, he went to HBCU. There's a lot of guys that played. Back then, you also had um, a, a kid. Uh, I, I can say the defensive back went to uh, was that played back in the day. Uh, I see his face. I can't call his name. Older, older gentleman, and he went to uh, Florida a and But there's a lot of guys. But Bill Nunn is directly responsible for that because nobody was going to those black colleges and recruiting these players. And Bill saw a a niche there, and I think he kind of got. You know, got in Coach Noel's ear, and um, you know, and that and that's what took place. But you know who his son is? If you ever watched the movie Spike Lee, do the right yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an actor. Yeah, Leo yeah. Rahim. Leo Rahim. That's 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 his dad. But but um, yeah, I um. But hold on, but Greg, not- he was he was responsible for telling the Steelers, hey, there's a guy named Greg Lloyd from Fort Valley. What, let me tell you what happened. I tell you exactly what happened. Bill Nunn was the scout. Along with at that time, I tell you who came and who came and worked me out on on a um, Thanksgiving holiday was um, oh gosh I'm seeing his face man I tell you man it's, it's hard it was, when you, it was this after your senior year when, this is after my senior year after okay. my senior year Remember, I played in what they call the uh, back then we played in the black college uh, hall uh, all star game back then they call it the um, gosh oh my gosh. Man, when you're talking and you can't remember stuff, that's so crazy. it's like it's it's like equivalent to the McDonald's All American Basketball, right? It, it was it was called the Freedom Bowl. That's what okay. it's called. It was played in RFK Stadium. If you give me a moment, it'll come to me. But it was played in RFK Stadium. That's and in course, Washington, right? Washington. So I got the great, the great Eddie Rob as my coach, and I don't even know who was coaching on the other side. Mm-hmm. But Eddie, Rob, I'm the starter. And all I've ever played was outside linebacker. But Eddie Robb's got two of his guys that he want to put at outside linebacker because he knows scouts are going to be there. So come game day, they put me in the middle. And he put his guys out on the book side. Well, I let the team in tackles, scored the interception. I mean, uh, intercept the ball, should have scored. You know, it's still in my life. Should have scored. You know, and that was that's how it was. But that's playing out of position. Who was at that game, watching that game? Tony Dungy. Tony Dungy at the time was the Steelers' defense coordinator. He had already played for the Steelers, but he was the defense coordinator. So Tony probably said maybe two or three words to me, and that was about it. But I'm pretty sure that Bill Nunn had sent him there, you know, after talking to Bill, had sent him there to scout. But they weren't just looking at me. They were looking at the other guy, you know, in that group. And so, uh, matter of fact, uh, I think Ken Woodard, who played for Denver Broncos, was 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 in that in that same maybe in that same group with me. But uh, long story, um, oh gosh, I'm gonna see his name. I can't see his face, but Scout came down. And he's gonna probably be mad at me if he sees this. Came came down. He says, "Hey, listen, um, 
coach called me and said, there's a scout from the Steelers who wants you to run for him. And it's like, I'm going like, it's raining outside. I thought I said it on the inside, but it came out. It's like, oh, it's, rain, it's raining outside. And so coach said, well, put your long spikes on and, you know, and stuff like that and, you know, do whatever. But this is a, it's a holiday. So he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down there and do it. So I went down there, got my shoes, and I'm going to call his name, Tom Donahue. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving me that. Tom Donahue was his name. So Donahue came out, and he goes, you want to you run in the rain? I said, if you want me to run in the rain, I'll run in the rain. So I ran on grass, and I think the first run, the first run, it was like 4'6", something, like 4'6", raining on grass. Mm -hmm. And so he looked at me, he looked at me, and he goes, uh, has anybody else been here to run? He's like, no. He said, let's go to the gym. So I got changed shoes, I go to the gym, and I run again for him. And then he looks at me, and he goes, okay, let's run that, run that again. He run it again. So I ran again. And so I'm too afraid to ask, what was my timing? Because, see, I knew at that little thing that we had did at RFK, I had run like 4-5. I run 4-5 for the scouts at, at that thing. But this was like an individual thing. And so shortly after that, man, I started getting like two to three scouts, you know, calling and coming and calling and coming. And I promise you, I thought I was, I thought I was going to go – to Dallas Cowboys. Why? Because Dallas Cowboys are very good at sending you a bunch of crap. Man, they sent me, and, and, and I'm going to whisper this, I grew up, that was my team. Oh, shit, okay. Everybody else in the house was watching the Pittsburgh Steelers, but the Cowboys was my team. And so, you know, I'm thinking like, I'm going to the Cowboys. Oh, I'm getting called. They're sending me all kind of paraphernalia. And of course, you know, the Steelers, the Steelers draft me. And, um, man, yeah. So I, I say um, Bill Nunn had a lot to do with me being drafted by, by the Steelers. Absolutely. See that? My, my boy Timmy from California, he's a huge Steelers fan. He says, Eddie, you have to ask him about Bill Nunn. Nobody uh, knows about this. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Bill has passed on since then. Matter of fact, I'm thinking Bill is in. Bill is Bill got posthumously. Uh, I'm not sure he did it before he died. But Bill is in the in, in NFL. He yeah, is in he the is. Whole, in, for being a scout. So that's how good. That's exactly how good he was. All right. So now you got drafted by the Steelers, sixth round. Then what? What happens then? Now you're like, okay, you gotta you gotta represent in camp. That's how it is. Otherwise, you're fucking gone. That's how uh, it's in the NFL, right? You're absolutely right. Well, I, I'm going to tell you what with me. When I came in, like I said, I came in not knowing anything. I mean, I, I wasn't that, like, you know, when you go to some of these schools that they do now, they, they, they got the NFL plans and everything down. They know what these guys are doing. They know, you know they, they're they running defenses that these guys are probably going to. Well, wait, hold on, Greg, Greg. I'm going to interrupt you. How much did you get paid? What was your signing bonus or contract? I want to know <laughs> back then. <laughs> For a six rounder, how much did you get? <laughs> All right, it's almost embarrassed to say, but my my signing bonus was twenty six thousand dollars. My base pay was sixty eight thousand dollars. That's it. That was it. That was my base. My first year. My no, first okay, year. Hold on, it went up. It went up. It went okay, up no, I get that part. But what about the first rounders? How much did they get? They're signing back then. Well, first round was called Woody Roy Woodson was my was my first rounder, and I think Delton Hall was the second round that year. So Woody was probably he was probably close to probably half a mil, probably half a four hundred thousand dollars like that right there. So it wasn't it wasn't. Listen, you had to be a quarterback or a really really good wide receiver mm -hmm. to be made close to a million dollars when I when I came into the league. And so when I came in on my team, my quarterback was garbage. But Louis Lips was probably probably one of the highest paid guys and Walter Abercrombie in the first game. They were probably the highest two paid guys on, on on the team, you know, when I when I got there. And um again, you know, you're talking about John Stallworth who had put put in legendary work. You know, he he still wasn't being paid what he was, you know, what he what, for the work he had put on the field. But uh, 
Yeah, man, it, it's compared to <laughs> compared to today. Oh, it's 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 a uh, it's a um, lot 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 different. But then different. you know what? After taxes, and you got to pay taxes in every state you play in, man. You're there you not go. Making money. There you, You're not making shit, listen, bro. man. Listen, bro. I bought a brand new Nissan Maxima. <laughs> Did you get the rims and all that stuff too? Yeah, the whole, got the whole. <laughs> and you had the, the system too. You had the system. Well, it came with that. I wasn't that guy, but it oh, came okay. with that. I, I I bought a black and gold Nissan Maxima. And the more thing I did, I think I put a kid on it. That was about it. But back then, listen, you bought, and I was raised like that. You bought what you you don't live up, you didn't live above your means. My salary dictated what I was driving. <laughs> you know what I mean? My my salary dictated what I was driving. But I can tell you this, man. I was I was you know once I started making, I I I, I was very benevolent with you know churches and stuff that i grew up with and people and you know some family members and stuff like that but i i never um you know i i just i just kept grinding because i always thought about home i always thought about this shirt like these these these, these people here the people that i went to high school with and the people they can go somewhere and they can say i went to high school with the guy people go ain't no way like my boy, like I say, it was the coolest thing going to my high school year. The guys going, and they're going, man. People still don't believe I know you. Man, they still don't believe. They still don't believe that we went to school together. We was in sick. I go, I get it. I go, I, I get it. I get it. But that was my thing. My thing was about pride. I mean, and, and like you said, I, I, I'm one of those guys that I figured if I did the work, that other thing, that other thing would come up. You know, if you, if you, if you're good, if you're good. Even if the Steelers don't want me anymore, but if I'm good, another team because I, you know, I got film and that film is showing what I'm doing in practice. Film showing what I'm doing. But if they, if we have any kind of uh, 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 where we can't get along, we can't do something. My film is my resume, and I can take it anywhere and I can sell it. And but I, it never happened. You know, I wanted to be a Pittsburgh Steeler. I wanted to stay there. And I'll be totally honest with you. I kind of took a pay cut to stay there because I had opportunities when I had contracts come up to go other places that were paying me, paying me a lot more money. But that's still an organization, man. There's something about it. There's something about that black and gold. There's something about the Roonies that that you go, you know, everybody won't do it. Now, when the money got like the money got now, you know, when you start talking about, hey, am I going, if you know, if I'm in that situation, <laughs> then it's like, okay, you stay in Pittsburgh, you make 50 million, you go over here, you make 150 million, okay, that's a no, that's a no brainer, you know, for those of us, you know, and stuff like that. But when you're talking chances, you know, when you're talking about um, legacies, when you're talking about, you know, ownership and things of that nature back in the day, everybody was trying to become and be like. Pittsburgh Steelers. Oh, you That's guys, it. let me tell you something. Traditionally, you guys, yeah. I mean, yeah. Steelers is like, you yes. know, I know on a Sunday in Pittsburgh, when you guys play, the city is empty. They're either at the stadium or they're inside their homes watching. There's nobody like, hanging out. Is, if, you, if, you were, if you could go to Three Rivers Stadium, and I'm not talking about Heinz Field, whatever it's called now, but if you could go to Three Rivers Stadium on a Saturday night, before game, you would go, what in the world? You would think there was a game going on inside the stadium already. The tailgating and stuff that they did, it was it was phenomenal, man. It was phenomenal. But it's like these people think enough of me and my teammates to be out here in this cold freaking weather, you know, dealing with the elements. To watch uh, just to get a glimpse of us to watch us play, you think that I'm gonna slack in practice? You think I'm not gonna I'm gonna hang out three, four, five, drinking and boozing and partying and not go do my part? I'm not I'm not that guy. Oh no way! I, I I couldn't see that. Yeah, now, I'm not that guy. Now, Greg, so back to the story. So you got to camp. You got hurt. 
Now you're out for a year and a half, right? I mean, you, you what did you did you have doubts in your mind like my career could be over? This is it. I'm done. I tell you what, I was thinking it as soon as it happened because of where I went to school. I was thinking it, and I'll tell you what happened. And nobody knows this, and it's giving me chills to think about it. The chief, the chief, the the, the the original Dan Rooney, the chief. I was at Divine Providence Hospital. I don't even think Divine Providence probably even exists anymore in Pittsburgh, but it's right there on the north side. I was in Divine Providence Hospital. I was laying up there. They don't cut my knee open and did whatever they're going to do to it. Nobody came to see me. Nobody was coming to see me. First person to come in my room to see me was the chief. And he came over, and I didn't think the chief knew me or... Like, was, that a, was that the Art Mooney? This is Art Rooney, the chief, wow. with the long cigar, the chief. The chief came over, and I know I probably say Dan, but yeah. The chief came in the room, called me by my name, and said, you know what, Lord, you're going to be okay. He said, just get well, you're going to be okay. And he turned around and walks out, and I was just like, that was the chief. Nobody else came. The only other people that came to see me were doctors and you know, that was it. So I got sent home and I went home and, you know, thinking I'm going to be home for whatever. And by the time I got home, I was probably home for about two to three weeks. And I got a call and they said, okay, you bring your rear end back up here and start rehab. Because I'm thinking, I'm done. Right. I'm, you know. And I rehab this knee, man. And then, you know, you you know, I, I'm like, okay, I'm ready. I came back. We plan, you know, you know, doing doing the things I need to do. And then Mike Merriweather has a uh, contract dispute, and Mike goes to uh, Minnesota, I believe. And um, I'm playing, and the position is wide open. We got you know Brian Hinkle's on one side, and they running everybody they can off of his other side. And it's not solidified. And then I, um, last preseason game, I'm chasing Randall Cunningham in PA and popped my right knee ACL two years in a row. I'm a liability. Now, who's not thinking they're going home? Who's not thinking they're going home? I'm thinking like, well, I um, took my left one, and I just popped my right one. And that was the first game my Uncle Charlie came to watch. My Uncle Charlie was a Negro League baseball player. He lived in Ohio. And he would always come up for the preseason game. And that was the first one he came to. And I remember coming out of the lobby on a pair of crutches. And he was looking at me. And he just told me, he said, all right, fella. He, said, he, said, he called me buddy. He said, all right, buddy. You're going to be okay. And he got his car left. Man, nothing he can do. So now I got to rehab again. But see, back then, Injury reserve, if they decided they want to leave a spot for you on the team, they could. So that's the, that's the last preseason game. My first official NFL game came about probably about nine weeks, about nine weeks later. I rehabbed that. I told my ACL about nine weeks later. They did this funky tape job on me, and they asked me, was I ready to play? And Coach Noel had Merle Hodge to cut me in practice to see if my knee was ready. It scared me so much. I picked my helmet up, probably threw it from one end zone to the other end zone. And that was my reintroduction to Joe Green. Joe Green walks over to me. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't grab me like this. But he walks over with me and grabbed my shoulder pad. And he was like, hey, go get that helmet. And I almost said, yes, sir. I did. I almost said, yes, sir, because he commanded that. And he goes, hey, listen, don't throw helmets out here. He said, listen, some of these guys are taking their temperature off of you. He said, don't do that. He said, listen, coach just trying to find out if your knee's good enough. He said, now you know. You got cut. He said, it probably hurt. It hurt you. He said, but now you know. I went back in there and I never looked back. I never thought about my knee again. So now, we come, Denver comes in to play. Elway is out. Remember who Elway's backup was? Mike no, I don't Kubiak. Remember. Mike Kubiak. Kubiak. 
who's the who's the head coach. Right. He was Elway's backup. They're trying to score a touchdown on the right side. I get Kubiak and I hit him, and he's in between his head. It's like in between my legs. He gets up and takes the football and flips it in my face. You can't do that to me. You can't do that to me. You can't do that to me. Best the quarterbacks. I ain't like my own quarterbacks. I know I don't like this guy. So I, I'm, I'm ready to go put my foot on him, but I can't put my foot on him, so I, I punch him. Referee standing right there. Not big deal, just flag. So they just get a little bit closer. So they come around, and they try to score again. My knees and my butt are on the other side, on this side of the of the goal line. It's on that side of the goal line. And the referee throws his hands up in the air. And I jump up and turn around and go, you got to be kidding me. Well, you know, I brushed it. Didn't do it intentionally. Right. Ejected. My first NFL game, I get injected. Ejected. <laughs> I get ejected from the game. So I, I don't know the rules. I'm still learning the rules. I go to the sideline. And somebody said, well, Greg, you can't stay out here and watch the game because I wouldn't sit on the bench. They said, you can't stay. Well, you got to go inside. So instead of just walking down the sideline and then going through the tunnel, <laughs> I went across the middle of the field. I went across the middle of the field and turned around and went. <laughs> and the crowd went crazy. And that began that crazy man playing crazy football. And I never looked back after that. I did. I never looked back after that. And Coach No. I can tell you, he has he has um, practice. He has get him out of there. I I've heard get him out of there so many times. And you know, when 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 Kyra came in, he would stop practice and say, "Hey, we're not playing the Pittsburgh Steelers today." Looking right at me, and it was like, "This is how we practice. This is how we practice. This is how we practice. We're gonna practice just like this." And don't care, you know. He would he would go trust your trust your uh, trust your God. Trust the guy next to you and all that giving us speeches. As soon as he leaves, I say, listen, F that. You, don't you trust that joker next to you. You don't know what the hell he's thinking about. Don't trust him. Everybody assumes that that guy going to miss that freaking tackle and go to the football. And that's how it was. So it was like, I don't know how it happened, but it was like all of a sudden people are listening to me. People are trying to be what I'm trying to be. And I like I said, I didn't think I was was where I was. It was just that it was the way I practiced. And I practiced what I preached. I practiced hard. I wouldn't come off the field. They were like, you gotta let your back up get some work. I said, my back up not gonna play on Sunday. So I'm taking all my reps. And and then I wanted to go over and take reps with the first unit just to see, you know, what they're doing. You know, give me that I want that speed. And I would go over there, and they would be looking at me. You know, they had the little posters written up, Greg, we want you to go here, we want you to go here. And I would just look at them and start laughing. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going there. I'm going to the football. And I would go to the football, and then that's how it all started. Guys were trying to, they, oh, they were trying to hurt me. And they said, hey, just run the play. You just run. I said, so y'all want me to run up in there so y'all can trap me? I'm like, I'm not like that. I said, i tell you what you do. I said, y'all tell that the LT when you play LT on Sunday. When he lines up. He starts on the right side. He ends up on the left side. Y'all going to tell him to switch sides so y'all can block him? Right. I said, listen, man. I said, make the adjustment. I said, y'all make the adjustment, you know. And so it was good for me and it was good for them. And it just, you know, it just flourished like that, man. So everybody that came into, into play, whether he was an offensive player or defensive player, I think I always challenged them to be the best. And it's like, it's, isn't it good to find out in training camp if you got a guy that can play or not? I really want to find out in the AFC Championship game on fourth down and we need two yards to extend it to go to the t- You want to find out then? No, let's find out in training camp if this joker can play. Yeah. And if he can't play, if he can't play, we'll beat his ass every day in practice and we'll beat the crap out of him every day in practice. And if he stays after he's taking that butt whooping, then I can trust him. But if he's, if he's, if he's a puss in practice... I can guarantee you he's going to be one in the game. So let's just find out right now. You know, what? you know what's crazy, Greg? I just watched a documentary last night on Urban Meyer for the University yeah. of Florida. Did you okay. see that shit? He I has the same mentality exactly right. like yours. Exactly. Right. I was like saying to myself, that's fucking Greg Lloyd's mentality right yeah. there. Urban Absolutely. Meyer said the same thing. He said, Ooh. I want to know. Who's going to quit? I want people to quit because Listen, then I can't take them on a mission with me. I can't take them to that Saturday game and see if he can hang. I can't. 
I, I always, I'm thinking like this right here. I think about when we came to training camp. Training camp then versus training camp now. Training camp then, you know, we would come in two weeks before we had a preseason game. And those two weeks were two weeks of tour dates. None of these guys today could do that. No. None of them would be willing to do that. And you know what we did on day one? You came in that morning, you ran whatever, you know, they wanted to see what kind of physical, you know, you were in, what kind of, you know, how you were in. You ran it that morning. Guess what we was in that afternoon? That afternoon we was in pads. Guess what we were doing that afternoon with Chuck No? We were doing the Oklahoma drill, buddy. Chuck No wanted to find out where his dogs were right away. He wanted to know where his dogs were. And when it was done, Oklahoma drill was just part of practice. It wasn't... Oklahoma drill, and then you line up and stretch. That was, it was funny as all get up. And think about this, though. And I, and I put this to, to, to some people last week. Think about this, though. Okay. So you and I got, let's just say you have a kid. Mm -hmm. You've been training this kid since he was six years old. You're going, you know, you're buying him all the, you got all the right coaches, all the right nutrition and all this stuff. And, you know, he, he, you know, he, you know, you're doing all this stuff. So he goes to high school and, you know, he's doing great in high school. He gets to go, you know, gets a scholarship. He goes off to college and you're there. You're watching every game. You're, you're participating in all he's in high school, making sure you got all the best gear. And then all of a sudden he, let's just say he, he don't even get drafted, but he gets a chance as a free agency to go to a training camp. And doing training camp at some point, something takes place. And he says, I can't do this shit no more. And if I'm not supposed to curse, man, blot it out, please. No, no, please he's, curse, curse. He said, he said, he says, I can't do this shit no more. And then he comes home to you. What do you say to him? This mofo leaves in the middle of the night. This is what he's been wanting to do since he was six. And now there it is right in front of him. And he says it's too hard. And he walks out of train camp. He doesn't get cut. He willingly walks out of training camp in the middle of the night, gets in his car, and he drives to God knows where, but he's gone. And the next day, you know, when you've been, you know, doing this for a while, you start looking around, you help going, somebody's missing. Getting to the front of this line way too quick. Somebody's missing. And then somebody said, oh, you know, such, such, such left last night. And then such, such, such left last night. Different story of saying, he got cut. Get that. But you just walk away, Lee. Now, when he walks in your house, what the fuck do you say to him? You're not a man, man. See, what the fuck do you say to him? This is something you've been wanting to do. So this is what I've been trying to get people to understand. When you see these guys that are, and I'm not going to call their name because I don't want any guy to me because I, I understand it. I still do this. And this is, they don't want, they don't want, I, I'm not, I'm not a guy, but I'm, I'm going to speak what's, what's right. Right. When you see guys, some guys peak in college, mm -hmm. but you got scouts who see them and say, yeah, we can use that guy. That guy's going to be good because they haven't done this. They haven't measured this thing right here. You go out there and all he benches this, he runs this fast and he can jump this high. What about this thing right here? Y'all put, y'all put something on there and measure, can't measure. And you won't be able to measure until he gets out there and he meets somebody like me and I put my forearm on him and I talk shit to him and I tell him how much is, uh, I'm going to do to his mama and what I'm going to do to his wife and stuff like that. So you can't get the mental part. So you'll be mentally with, you know, I don't mean nothing about it, but we just, we just testing him. And when he can't take it, it's like, well, why did you draft him in the, in the first round? Why did you draft him in the first round? And the people want to go, well, dude, he's bust. Well, it's not his fault. It's the people who, you know, if you, if, you, if you got people around you that are not doing their job to help you out, that's your fault. Your job is to make sure that the people that you got helping you do whatever it is that you do, that they got their shit together. They got their shit together. You want to hire the best people. You don't want to hire the people who look like you. You want to hire the best fucking person. Right. And that's the issue today. Coaches are hiring people that's going to be, how you say it? Yes, sir, boy. Babying them. The yes, sir, boys. You're like, yes, sir, coach. Yeah, I mean, you got like, motherfucker, you know, that's some bullshit that you're talking about. Why, why would you say some dumb shit like that right there? That's not, but 
that's what you wanted. And you sit back and you go, well, these other guys in here supposedly got clout. You would think that they would say something. But ain't nobody saying nothing. It's like, dude, come on. You know, somebody say something. But it's like, you guys are drafting guys based on something that you've seen on paper, not understanding that some of these guys, they played, when they played their last college game, that was the pinnacle of their career. And you want to put them in a league now, and it's like, they ain't got nothing left. It's not always that way, but a lot of times it is that way. And now you try not to hurt a scout's feeling. A guy that works for the organization, you try not to hurt his feeling. He made a bad decision. So if you ever get a bad investment, I don't have few. But when you find out there's a bad investment, what do you do? You keep on investing in it? What do you do? You cut ties with it. Take your money, put it somewhere else, right? Right. So it's the same way because that's what these guys are now. These guys now are commodities, you know? And it's like, we can take that $20 million, or $50 million, $100 million, we spread it among, you know, four or five other guys. And hopefully, we're hoping that out of these four or five guys that we get, one will be okay. And that's what happens. That's what happens a lot of times. You know, when you get a guy that's a first-round draft choice, and he plays like a first-round draft choice, that's great. But again, that's what's happening. So these guys today, it's hard to compare because I know that the rules have changed and things are here. But at the end of the day, we're still playing football. Yeah. At the end of the day, you still got to go out and play football. You got to still go out and play football the way we play football. You can't just go out, I mean, you know, and do certain things. So when the rules change, and then you see the dichotomy of the league change, and nobody wants to talk about it and stuff like this, and that's that's probably for another time. But, yeah, it's just it's just different, man. Like I said, a lot of these guys wouldn't, they wouldn't, they, they couldn't play in our era. A lot of these guys couldn't play. They, could, they couldn't have made it through training camp in our era. Greg. If you had an option, would you rather have Coach Noel over Bill Cower your whole career or vice versa? I'm going to put and, you on the spot right now. I'm going to be honest with you. Say that, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say it like this. Coach Noel, four-time Super Bowl champion. Bill Cower should have been probably three-time Super Bowl champion. Both had exactly what and knew how to get what they need to get out of their players. Coach Noel made sure, very similar, and they're very similar in ways. I don't know how Coward knew it or understood it, but Coach Noel, defensive-wise and offensive-wise, you had to know what every guy in your position was doing. Wait a minute. So you're saying Coach Noel, that with the playbook, you got to know – what the quarterback's doing, what the, uh, the tackles you, are doing. If you, if you are on offense, mm -hmm. you need to know your quarterback and you need to know the guy on the other side of you. Because think about it. it you know, you got to know what X is running versus what Y is running. If he's running up, you don't want to run guys into him. So you have to know what every player does. You got to know what the blocking scheme is. You know, you got to know if it's going to be a quick out and things like that. Yes. Defensive wise, the same thing. You always got to know where your strength is. You always got to know where your help is. You know, where's my help? Is my help inside? My help outside? What's my defensive end doing? My defensive end crashing down? Is he coming up the field? Because if he is, then I can fold back. You have to know those things. Those things were imputed on us to know. And the guys that got it and understood it are the guys who stayed. The guys that didn't or the guys who kept making mistakes and running up somebody's back or getting some, get, the plays getting to the outside and things. That's what, we that's what studying film was about. And in that light, they were both very similar. Coach Noel was more of a, of a, of a how do you say it? He was more of a show me kind of guy. Okay. So one offense versus one defense on a Friday. Say that. Go somewhere and say that in the league right now. Say, okay. First offense up, first defense up, short yardage, goal line, six plays in a row. How many guys you think would be calling the union saying, you ain't going to believe this shit, man. They got us hitting them. That's what we did, bro. And I'm saying if we lost, it wasn't because we just – we lost because the team was better than us. We were ill-prepared. But nobody was going to ever come out there. And manhandle us. Nobody's gonna ever come out there and out hit us, out work us. That wasn't gonna happen. But yeah, we lost some game. Coach Kyra came in and changed all the hitting. We still hit. 
but we didn't do the hitting on a Friday. The hitting on a Friday became more of a go out there and put your stuff on, you know, and stuff like that. Now, guys will tell you, and they'll look at this and go, G. Lord lied because he know he used to knock the hell out of us on Friday. Because I still used to pop the ass on Friday. If you come up in that hole running too hard knowing we ain't got nothing on, I'm like, slow your ass down, Coach. Don't try to make us look bad. Because Coach is going to steal the high grade. You know you got it. I'm like, listen, Coach, we got shells on. This little fuck. Okay. I said, okay, what? Okay, 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 okay. Next play, somebody's on the ground. And he goes, I said, I told you to run your little punk ass up. That's, that's what we did. But you had to set that tone to let everybody know that we're not, dude. You know, we got no pads on this. Go. So Kyle understood trying to save your body a little bit more, and he did that. But in the same regard, he needed you. He wanted you to know. We had, Kyle would stand in the room, unlike Coach No. Kyle would stand in the room now. With Coach No era, we all had tests. You still get a test. Just like a just like teacher said, announced on Monday. There's going to be a test over chapter two and three on Friday. Walk in there on Friday, they hand you a thing. So you get ready to get on a plane on a Saturday. Everybody pretty much had assigned seats, you know, where you were going to sit at. You sat, you had a partner. And coaches would come there and they would just hand you your, 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 um, they would hand you your, 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 your exam, so to speak. You have an exam and you would sit there and write it. Now, funny part about it is the guys who are watching this are going to know this is the truth. I had Marvin Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> And Marvin would give me, Marvin would give me tests and I would just tear them fuckers up. I'll tell you that, I ain't really taking no fucking tests. I'll tell you, tell you what, I'll tell you what. I said, my test is on Sunday. My test is on Sunday. And if I if I screw that up, then you can do whatever you do. But I'm not taking no tests. I'm not I'm not taking no tests. That's I, I got to that point where I ain't taking no tests. But Kyle used to stand in the room like on Friday and he would go, Greg Lloyd, playing pitch on, on, on such such a down, da da da. They come out in this right here. What are they trying to do? What, what are the three things that they can do? And that's what your books close. You need to know that. Mm. And that's you on the spot. You Johnny on the spot. And if you can't answer that, you think your peers behind you got confidence in you? And that's what they did. But we came in, one of the great things we did, I think Rod Wilson probably started. Rod, people think Rod was a great uh, athlete and he was, but more than that, Rod Wilson was a star. Study it, man. He was a stud. He and Carnell Lake. He and Carnell Lake got me into a long way. I put, I put it before them too. It was David Little. They got me into studying film and watching film because everybody has tendency. Everybody's got a tendency to do something. Everybody's got a tendency to do something on one side and then create a formation on the other side that looks very sad and then do it from that side. Everybody does it. And you just have to be smart enough to see what's going on. If you watch enough film, you pick up on those things. And so the game day, when you start seeing this, and it's, it's like it's kind of like a dream coming back. You go, oh, I remember this. I remember this right here. And, it, and then you you don't have a problem with saying, you know, whatever your call is for run. You know, we may have a, some little call that we say to everybody, this is a run, and some little call to say to everybody, this is pass. And everybody's alert. Everybody's on the same page. And now... You can you can you can run a hundred miles an hour knowing that this is what they're trying to do, and when quarterbacks figure it out, they start doing it. You know, like you say, you get the Peyton Manning, they start getting up there and barking numbers and changing and trying to do stuff. But the formation doesn't change. If the formation changes, then they may do something. But if the formation stays the same, and you know he's just wolfing. That's all he's doing. So that was understood. So the differences like that. The differences are like that. Both both that way. I can tell you. I tell you, like you say, this is the funny part. Coach Noel, meeting room, everybody's in there. You got somebody watching for Coach to get ready to come in there for the for the, for the meeting in the morning, right? So Coach will walk in the room, and it would be a crescendo. Everybody talk, ah, Coach, Coach would shadow catch that door. It would go, nobody had to say anything. Bill Carr walks into the room. We still do this. Hey, man. And he's up on the podium going, okay, guys, okay, guys, Okay, okay, guys, okay, guys, everybody still talking. And then finally he go, okay, okay, guys, okay, guys, come down. That was a different because he understood. Coach No would have never tolerated that. Not mean that he wasn't, he was, but he was just who he was. It was his personality, his personality. Everybody respected that. He, he, he called the emperor for a reason. You know what I mean? He was called the emperor for a reason. But Kyle had a little bit more of a um, laid back players kind of mentality. Just as long as you're doing your job. 
you know, you give you a little bit of slack. Don't right, don't take so, don't take advantage of it. All right, so Greg, if you were the GM and you had to hire between those two coaches for your organization, who would you hire? I would probably quit the GM job because I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to make that decision. Oh shit! Okay, <laughs> I, would, I really wouldn't. I wouldn't want to make that decision. And that's and that's that's hats off to both of them. I've had them both. But a lot of people gonna always look at championships. That's what people look at. People look at championships and say, Kyle won one, Noah won, I mean, uh, Coach Noah won uh, four, so let's hire Noah. And again, you know, you gotta talk about the people in the room. You know, you gotta understand. And one of the, one of the things about being a leader and, and, and things of that nature, is there's no popularity contest and, and, and being a leader. Leadership is, is not being popular, being captain, being whatever. There's no popularity contest, so so that would be hard. It would be it would be very hard. And if I was general manager, I would probably quit. Wow. If I had to, do, if I had okay. To do that, so quit. Greg, now you guys, you guys made the Super Bowl, right? Now, what was the game plan? Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Your position as an outside linebacker, first of all, you're gonna have to deal with the you have to deal with the zone. You have to deal with the tackle. You have to deal with the tight end. You have to literally cover the zone, and also you want to kill the quarterback. You want to sack him, right? There's a yeah. there's a difference between you and a pass rusher. Just goes in there and tackles, right? What was well, the game plan? What was the game plan in the Super Bowl? Because I noticed in you with the stats, I didn't really see any sacks from you. But I I I said to myself, well, maybe they were playing the zone more against the Dallas Cowboys. No, really. It, it, I'm going to tell you what. You know, when, when you're in the Super Bowl, that particular Super Bowl, you had the number one offense in the league versus the number one defense in the league. And basically, it's going to come down to who's going to make the, you know, the, the, the short of my mistakes. We knew what they wanted to do. Our defense and game plan never changed defensively. Mm. From day one in training camp, we stopped the run. If we stopped the run, we make everybody one-dimensional. We make them more than throw the football, and then we open up our Blitzburg defense. Okay? Mm -hmm. What we got to stop the run from? We have to establish dominance on the line of scrimmage. And um, I can't say in the first quarter or the first half that we did, but the second half we did. The second half we came back out, and we held Dallas Cowboys to a total of 61 yards total offense, not just running but total offense. And you would think that that would turn the game over, but the two interceptions caused it, caused the game. But but when you're talking about, we didn't change the game plan. The game plan never changed. The game plan was always the same. The game plan, every game we played, whether it was a team that was 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 five, vying for a championship, a team that was vying for a division, whatever, the game plan never changed. It's always defensive-wise, we're going to hold a team to 17 points, under 17 points or under. We're going to hold a running back to 100 yards, you know, under 100 yards. And and we're going to, we're going to you know, we're not going to let them get but so many yards. That's how you get to be, you know, number one defense. That that, that was our goal. Now, looking back on on, on what, what what took place, I don't think I've watched it, watched, watched the, um, that game yet. But you start looking back on it, and uh, right away you start looking like they're going to have some success. But you also got to understand, we had some guys that we had plugged in some places who weren't sure of themselves because of an injury with Rod Wilson. Wilson came back, but again, we had put some guys out there that were um, you know, really not sure of themselves. So, so once we got settled, and I still think we were still not we were we never got to be the Blitzburg team that we were because of the different things that Dallas were doing. And like you said, they did their homework on our defense just like we did our homework on their offense. And it's like there were no big plays. They got they won the game on two freaking interceptions. Right at to Larry Brown, right there. Yeah, they won the game on two freaking they they didn't do anything like, oh man, they just hit him for 35 yard, you know, some 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 kind of, you know, I think the very first play of the game, Larry Allen came around and I felt like it was the whole offensive line. Hey, man, dude, I mean, I'm I can't tell you how much I was giving up there. But I have force, which means I can't let nothing get outside of me. 
And it looks like Larry Allen is knocking me up in the stand, but I got to hit and make Emmett go inside. Emmett goes inside. Safety's got to be there to make that play. Okay? So they line up in it again. I go inside line. I tell Coach, I tell uh, Coach LeBeau, I said, hey, listen, let's do this. If they run that play again, I said, let me crash down. Let me crash down. I said, because, see, I can get down inside and get up in the backfield before Larry Allen gets around me. I said, so I can tie all that up and then make Emmett run into everything. So when I do it, the funny part about it, when I did see part of the highlight, you hear Meyer Cope going, I don't know what happened. Looked like Emmett Smith just fell on the ground himself. I, I, if I could have found him that day, I would have shook his ass. But it was like, you know, I didn't care for him. But it was like, um, yeah, I went down there and crashed it and caused the collision in the backfield. But again, it's called making an adjustment. You make the adjustment. It's like, are we going to still let Larry Allen come out here and keep hitting me and knocking me out here like this right here and, and letting Emmett Smith run up in there? Or you just let, let me run up in there and blow all that up. You know, by the time that ball snap, I see that I'm three yards in the backfield. They got to do this. And if they're doing this, our guy should be, you know, be getting there, scraping over. The so that was it. That was probably, you know, it. I mean, you know, I think uh, Novacek may have caught past two or things like that. But understand this about that defense with the three, four defense. Steelers still running. But the Steelers have one guy on their, on their, on their I don't know, I, I think they played Atlanta last night. I still didn't watch the game because I don't watch a lot of football now. But they got one guy that pass rushes. You know, in the Watt kid. Everybody else on that defense, all the other linebackers on that defense are a what? I mean, there's no studs. There's no, there's no guy. But that's the difference in us. When I played outside linebacker for the Steelers in that same defense that they're running right now, I had three scholarships. How many times have you seen T.J. Watts drop back in pass coverage? How many times have you seen him cover the best back out of the backfield? Not that much. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Kevin Green never covered the best back out of the backfield. It doesn't happen. So when I was playing, I was a cover linebacker. So I don't get to rush on third down. I got to cover fucking Eric Metcalf. I got to cover fucking Barry Sanders. I'm too fucking nightmare. That shit right there is going to keep you up all night. But also you, you have to the tight end. You got to go, go through, right? But that depends. That depends on if we're in nickel, if we're in nickel or not. See, on, on, like I said, on third down, I move from the outside to the inside, and I've got you know you know some stuff going on with safeties and stuff like this right here. But our pass rushers now they got their hands on the ground. You put Chad got his hand on one end, Kevin got his hand on the other end, and I'm I'm a cover linebacker. I got to cover if it's a run. I got I got to make the play. So so that's the difference now. But the, the difference, difference is that's that's you being a great player right there. That's the that's, definition of a great player. Three scholarships. See, I don't have one scholarship. I'm not. You can't say that I'm pass rushing. Mm-hmm. When I got a, when I get a chance to pass rush, I pass rush. I'm not gonna get as many chances as these other guys get. But if I don't get a quarterback sack, then my number's not gonna be way up there. But what happens when I gotta cover those guys out of backfield and I knock the ball down and I cover them? Nobody's looking at that as a. It's like a sack, right? But it is. But it is. Mm-hmm. Okay. So 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 I have that, and like I said, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't get upset about it because that's what I was there for. Coach Kyle put me in that position because he knew that I was going to be, I was the best of the linebackers that we had to do it. But again, I got three scholarships. I got to be able to cover. I got to be able to pass rush and I got to be able to, to run block. I got, I mean, I got to be able to stop. I got to be able to do that. I got to be able to, you know, Make plays in the backfield. I got to be able to not let anybody out run me to the sideline. I got to be able to cut plays back. And then there's going to be plays that I got no business making that I'm supposed to make. And then there's sometimes you got to run to the other side to make the play. And make plays. Absolutely. And that's what I'm saying. So, so, so when the team needs me, whether I'm tired or not, regardless of how much money I'm making, I can't afford to be standing on the sideline. Bad knees, bad ankles, fingers, feelings, whatever. If my T, if I, if I, if I put my my gear on, I'm playing, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna be on this. I'm gonna I'm gonna go and I'm gonna play. So that's the difference now, and, and what I see in the linebacker core is like it, four guys. Those four 
in that 3-4 defense, those four linebackers is what make that defense move. If you got four linebackers that are hellacious, if you got four linebackers and you don't know where they're coming from, they can get you from this side, they can get you from that side, they can get you from up the middle. Because if I'm a team, offensively, I'm going to double team TJ Watt every down. I double team his ass every down. I, would, I double team every now. So you can't do that to me because you got 91 over there. Then we do it to 91, you got me over there. Then you try to do it to both of us, you got big boy and old fast ass Chad Brown coming down the middle. Can't do it because we got, dude, we got three fucking, four fucking all pro linebackers playing. <laughs> can, you, can you believe that? We have four all pro linebackers playing. What are you going to do? Yeah. What are you going to do? Greg, let me ask you this. What do you say to these guys? What kind of talking shit do you guys say? When you knock them out, do you, like, if, if I, like, listen, I'm an actor, so I know if I played you, would I look at the sideline and say, yo, get another person in here, man. He can't hang with me. W were you saying shit like that? Well, I mean, the ultimate shit talker, man, when I, when I was coming up was, have you ever heard LT talk shit? I wish I did, but I, I did. I mean, highlights, yeah. <laughs> that's, your, that's your New York boy. That was, LT is the goat of all that shit, man. We all just came in. I won't say we emulated him, but we, we all had a portion of it. But for me, coaches always had guys on the on the on the on the board or on our paper when they were doing stuff. And they're gonna always put a guy up there and they go, shit to deal with. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 you know, they start giving us, hey. 78 is this, and then this guy's this, and then this guy's this, that. But this guy right here, number, 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 number 80, something like that. Oh, this guy here, this guy here, shit to deal with. So on my paper, I'm circling the guy who's shit to deal with. And that's who I want to see. I go out early and I run around. I'm looking for him. That's who I'm looking for. And if I ever see him when I'm running around the field, if he's out there, when I run past him, that's you can't do that today. Right. But back then, if I pass him, I go, hey, bitch, I promise you, I promise you that's going to be the only time you're going to catch a free ball today. It's going to be the only time you're going to catch a free ball today, and you're not going to look at this number right here. Keep going. Come by next time as I'm running. I'm running by next time. I'm trying to think of what I'm going to say to him when I come by him next time. Because he's just jogging around the field, getting loose. And I come back around again. I say, hey, don't get scared. It's just me. You know, I go around again and come back and I say, hey, listen, I'm going to be baby feeding you, babysitting you all day today. But that's just, it, it ain't nothing bad. But you're just getting in his head. Right, now, yeah. during the course of a game, during the course of a game, he's got the right. He can talk back. He can say whatever he want to say. But you know, what I got to do now is I got to go out there and back up what I'm saying. A lot of it is just part of the part of the game to get past all the BS and you know all that stuff. But it's like can't wait for the game to start. Now, when the game starts, if you talk shit to me, of course you are gonna get it back. I went to the black cards, man. And we talk shit. We talk shit going to the cafeteria. You know. So it's like it ain't no big deal to me. But the thing about it is, you got to back it up now. And if I get you talking, and you ain't worried about it. you ain't playing football no more, you know. And that's the whole thing. But but me hitting you, I remember Thomas Everett knocked. And I got there like a split second later. He knocked Al Toon out, and but for the Jets. Mm -hmm. And I got there as he hit the ground, and I slid in there like a referee with 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 with, with WWF wrestling. I slid in there and counted him out. One, two. Oh, they 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 were trying to hang my ass, you know, up up in that stadium, man, coming out of there. But the thing was, everybody was like, "Oh, that was that was barbaric." Or you didn't have to listen. Understand this: the fucking game we play is fucking barbaric. So guess right, it's supposed to be that, you know. And I'm not there to kiss anybody. I'm not there to try to make friends. I'm not there to try to hug on anybody, make you like me, come talk to me. You know, I'm not there. I'm there to fucking win. All I care about is those guys that are in my color jersey. I don't care about those other guys in the color jersey. For 60 freaking minutes, that's how I mean. It's a fucking war. Okay? And if you run out of fucking ammunition, you think I'm going to give you some? I'm still going to be fucking firing at you. That, that, that's how it's supposed to be. And a lot of people can't get like that. But it's intense, man. And everybody, everybody's not that way. And I, it's not my fault. It's not my fault that everybody's not that way. But if you're not on my level of intensity, you're going to get your ass whooped all day long. That's how it's going to be. Yo, Greg, you are pumping me up right now, baby. <laughs> I, I, holy shit. 
<laughs> I love it. I love your mentality, man. You got that play to win fucking attitude, not just in football, but in life. Life, in life, period. That's how it has to be. Absolutely. Holy Absolutely. shit. All right, so I'm going to ask you a couple of these questions, right? Hardest fucking quarterback to put down. Elway. Really? Elway? Out of all of them? Elway shook me off like a brick in you. You ever, you ever, you ever get hit bit by a mosquito? Uh, one of them flies, and you don't get him. And next time you do that to him, that's how he did me. He was like, I had it. I mean, I had it. I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't talking about like I had his legs. I had it. And I don't know what he had on him. And I tell him to this day to his face, he had some shit on him that was slippery. I had, and he went like this, bro, and I just went across. And as soon as I did it, I started laughing. As soon as it, happened, as soon as it happened, I started laughing. Because I already know I got to go to the sideline. And I know they're going to give me shit when I go to the sideline. And so we had a guy play with me then, my buddy Jeff Brady. Jeff Brady was playing with me. And I told Brady, I said, we can get it. I said, we can get it. I said, I said, but you got it. You got it. I said, I follow me. So Brady was playing inside. And I was playing outside. We run a game. I went inside. I went in, I went like I was going in outside and cut inside. And the tackle went with me. I told Brady, I said, when I do it, come right off my ass. Brady came off my ass, goes back there. He's got it. Yeah, we did something with his ass, shook him off, and I go back to the hub. I'm looking at him, I, and he looking at me, and he looking at me shaking his head. I go, I see a bad boy. <laughs> in, the middle of, <laughs> hey, in the middle of the game, in the middle of the game, we sit there go, I go, he's a bad boy. Yeah, but you know, shit happens like that. All but, right, um, so, okay, after Elway. Now, team you hated playing against, like you fucking hated this team. Raiders. Raiders. Raiders, Raiders and probably... Yeah, Raiders. I hate, I hate playing Raiders. Raiders who, was the home, who was the homecoming game, like the cakewalk team? Like, whatever. These guys suck. Uh, depends on what year it was, but from 92 to 96, every fucking body. But um, <laughs> uh, cakewalk team, that's a hard one, man. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put that out there. I don't think that was because, you know, because, you know, we, we've gone into some games with, uh, I mean, I put it like this. My, my first couple of years after I got my surgery and I was playing well, you know, we played Cincinnati, man, and Cincinnati with Boomer, and they had that other kid over there, that wide receiver they had over there, Boomer do that old fake shit like that, and that motherfucker was standing in the, in the end zone with the ball, and we thought Boomer still had it, but they beat our ass, Cleveland, Cleveland beat us, Cleveland beat us one year in two games. Now, you're saying Cincinnati, had- that Boomer Sison, right? Cincinnati Boomer Sison, you know, when you thought the Boomer Sison, they they be, I mean, you know, over the years after that, I mean, we beat the shit out of them. I mean, you know, it's like we were looking forward to beating that, but we had to go, we had to go play our game. But Cleveland Browns, you didn't look too forward to playing Cleveland Browns when Kevin Mack was playing. You didn't look forward to that. Kevin Mack hurt everybody on our team, bro. I hit Kevin Mack five yards in the backfield. He gained eight. <laughs> All right, ru- rush the passer or drop in coverage? Oh uh, boy, I could do either because I enjoyed it. You know, drop okay. it in coverage is like drop it in coverage is kind of like I- I- I'm playing assassin. I'm pl- I'm really playing assassin when I drop in coverage because you come running across there in my zone and you're looking for the football. Whether you get it or not, I'm gonna hit your ass. <laughs> All you gotta do, All you gotta do is ask. Uh, I can't think of his name right now, but kid talk shit on me. We played one game. We had to play him twice. And he talked shit on me in the first game, forgot that he had to play me in the second game. And first place in the game, I told Kyle. I told Coach Kyle. I said, I want Keenan McCarr. That's who it was. I asked Keenan McCarr. If you ever get a chance to ask Keenan McCarr, he's going to say, yeah, you nasty motherfucker. Yeah, I told him. I told him. That's exactly what he's going to tell you. He was, running, he was running across the middle. I had dropped in coverage. When Brunel was running, he left it. So he's running my way where I'm dropping at. And I just happened to see him out the corner of my eye. And Brunel, I didn't know what he was gonna do. When I, when I locked on, it's like a scud missile. When I lo- I locked on him, I I can't I can't undo it. I can't undo it. And I locked on to him. And today I probably would have been. They probably would have called the cops out into the stadium. And the God, you're violent. You are yeah. you are crazy. I love it, baby. All right. Dip, dip and rip or bull rush. Um, depends. It depends. I, Cause I I was both. I could I, I was speed guy, so probably for me it'd be dip and rip. Bull rush, I was too light. I remember understand this now. I only played at two twenty five. 
I like, know, I'm really light. That's really light. But I was strong as shit. Oh, but, hell yeah, but, you were. <laughs> but but think about, about, about going against the Ogdens and the Willie Rose that are in that 300 plus. You can't do that all day. You can't bull rush them all day. So dip and rip would probably be my best thing and just flat out out running them. You know, that, that would be my best. All right, so this this might answer the question. Big talker or a silent assassin? I already know. <laughs> <laughs> I can be both. I can I can be both. I'm like this. If you never say shit to me when we're playing, shit talking comes out. Well, wait, if I don't say shit to you, you if you don't say, if you don't say nothing to me while we're playing, then shit talking is gonna come out. That's what happened. If you're quiet. And you get over me, you quiet. Because when people get quiet, they think like, oh, I got. No. See, when you come to play me and you don't talk, and you don't say nothing, then the shit talker comes out. Now, when you talking shit, I'm contemplating how I'm going to kill you, or how I'm going to kill you, or how I'm going to get you. That's what's happening. I get quiet. I get quiet, and now I'm trying to anticipate when am I going to kill him? When am I going to get that shot on him? So it's just the opposite of that. But it's it's cold, man. It's cold. I mean, <laughs> I love it. People, I love it. People, people, people think that, like you say, it's intentional. You got to understand this. The same thing that I'm saying, somebody on the other side is saying the same thing about me. If they can get a shot on me and take me out, you think they're not going to take it? Fuck yeah, they're going to take it. So my thing of it is I got to get them before they get me. That's, that's the name of the game. You know, it's, it's always been the name of the game. Different game now, you know. Like I said, there's a lot of cats right now that everybody go, oh man, this guy. There's a lot of guys that are playing ball and a retired ball right now after I played. And if I hadn't been playing, you would have never fucking heard of them. You would have never fucking heard of them. <laughs> I love it. You would have never fucking heard of them. So, I can promise you, in the, era, in the era that they're playing right now, and in the era that we play right now, some of these guys that are playing, motherfucking catching the ball and get up talking shit. Them motherfuckers would have been in a stretcher. They would have been on a stretcher. I can guarantee you that. But they, you would have never heard of them. Let me ask you this. When you, when you hit somebody, right, and you see the stretcher coming up, does that make you feel good? You're like, yeah, I got this motherfucker. Not, not, not so much feel good. It's like, because it's, there's, it's, like I said, I don't go and hit you. Uh, I can't say that. I can't say that. There's I'm no way. Say, when you go for the quarterback, you're going to kill him. I already know but, it. I saw your highlights, man. I'm going to say this to you. I'm going to say this to you. I'm going to say this to you, and I tell everybody this that ever asks me any questions like that. I play to make people quit playing football. I don't know how that makes sense to you, but it's like if you got the audacity to come out and try to catch a ball or run the ball or try to do something to me, I'm really trying to make you quit playing football. I'm trying to make you quit playing. I'm trying to hurt you and hit you and do things to you to quit you. I want you to go to the sideline and say to the coach, "I'm done." That's like that's like that's like a a a a, a, a wide receiver trying to crack you. He'll try that shit one time on me, and he'll go to the sideline and say, "Don't y'all ever run that fucking play again? Don't you ever fucking run that play again?" Okay, but that's that was the deal. If you if you're not playing like that, if you're not thinking like that, man. And the other guy is, then you're going to always be prey. I'm never going to be prey out there. I never wanted to be prey out there. I'm going to always be the predator. I'm going to always be the predator. Not so much the alpha. I mean, we got a lot of alpha. Everybody talking about alpha. I'm a good, I'm, I, I mean, I'm, you know, at the time, you're a husband, you're, 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 you know, you're, you're, you're your dad. You're not trying. I understand other guys got wives and kids and things of that nature, but the game dictates that we got to be these guys. And it's like, if he's not on top of his game today, there's a good chance he can get hurt. If I'm not on top of my game, you know, I got hurt both, you know. To, but also, if, can, you're not, if you're not on top of your game too, you could get an L with your team. Yes, sir. Or you can get a um, pink slip. And it's like that, that pink slip hurts. That pink slip hurts a lot, man. Coach, coach, and, and, and it ain't nobody you know. They send a no name person, and coach said. Uh, Coach wanted to see and said, bring your playbook. Well, shit, take my playbook, tell Coach I can catch him later. I don't need to go in there and listen to that bullshit. You already know what's happening. And like, I'm gone, you know, kind of thing. But, you know, that would have been me. But it's like, I, I get it, but it's more, it's more mental than you can imagine it is. You got to get yourself in a frame of mind to be in, how many plays? Maybe 80 plays. You got to get your 
yourself in the frame of mind to be in 80 car wrecks because that's what they are yeah, yeah. They're car wrecks. that's the hit the hit is car wrecks oh yeah you so know? who 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 talk shit the most when you played? Like, who was oh. the talker? Well, other than Shannon, Shannon talked shit. Everybody did. Well, I had an offensive lineman talking shit, bro. You know? But, uh, but, 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 but I can't say that. I, I, I knew wide receivers, like, you're going to get Webster Slaw to talk shit to, to and, and, and Carl, uh, was, was played for Cincinnati. Uh, car guy, shit, car lived in my neighborhood. I can't think of his last name, but it come up. But but a lot of wide receivers talk shit. Running backs don't talk too much shit because they don't want they don't want to get hit. But mm -hmm. wide receivers, Webster Slaughter talked a lot of shit and stuff like that right there. But uh, you don't get some some offensive linemen that are there. Steve Wisniewski, Wisniewski was a nasty fucker, man. I I he, he grabbed my boy Rod Wilson and I almost had to put his ass to sleep. And I had to. I got fined for it. I got fined for it. It's like I, I tell, tell the people, like, listen, man, Wilson wear buck ninety. Wisniewski wear two seventy five. Tell me like this right here. I said, I said, let's put it in perspective. You're at home one day. Your 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 third grader gets off the bus, and sixth grader jumps him. You're the only one out there. Did you just let the third grader wear his ass whooping, or you go over there and get that sixth grader and get him off your kid, and you do it in a way that he'll never want to do it again? What do you do? I said, that's because that's what you're asking me to do. That's you're asking me to sit there and let, watch my 190-pound player get picked on by a 200-pound uh, you know, guy, and I'm supposed to just sit there and watch it? I said, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. From this day forward, if any of my guys that are, are on the way get picked on by offensive linemen, you're going to find me because I'm going to go in there and I'm going to break it up. And I said, I'm not sorry for it. If you want to find me, find me. Do whatever the fuck you're going to do. But that's what's going to happen. And... Biden got me sitting. Biden got Biden got going away because you have to put it in perspective. Because people got to understand this, like you know, yeah, it's a heat of a moment and feelings and everything is going around. But I'm never going to let a guy like that take, and especially you know, one of my guys. But he was notorious for that, man. But he was he was nasty. He was nasty. The other cat was nasty. We just I just talked with uh, I was with oh shit, uh, see his face played for uh, played for the Eagles, big back, played for the Eagles. We were he retired left there, I believe. And uh we were we were at a at a thing together. We was asking he was asking I told him I said, Yo guys had this nasty ass offensive line, Ron Hellman, I think that's his name. Played for the E. He was another nasty fucker. Talk shit. Nasty fucker. Spit on you the whole shit. You know, stuff like that. But he make you he make you like you know, you know how it is like in school. Somebody hits you, you throw in that haymaker. That's all the teacher sees is you. They always see the second guy. He he he's notorious for that shit. And he don't got me so many times as unreal. I told, I was telling, him, I said, man, I hated that fucker. I hated him with a pack. But now, now that you know, I understood what he was trying to do. He's trying to get me in my head. He's trying to get me out of the game. So he's the same yeah. thing as what you're doing. You're trying to test him, out. and he's doing the same shit to you. Absolutely. And you got to be smart enough to understand that if I can get him in between plays, I can do it. But. If I can't get him in between plays, I want to get him like I better tell him I meet your ass after I meet you after the game over with down in that fucking lot in that in that in that hallway down there where well, can't nobody see it. I meet you down there. That's how much I want to fuck you up. Shit, I'm scared shit <laughs> but, already, man. But, 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 but that's but that's that's just you know that's 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 how I go. So all right, so like, Greg, I'm gonna I'm gonna name you the running backs. Which one gave you a hard time? All right, I'm gonna start off. Gary Brown, Christian Okoye. Uh, Barry Ward, Leroy Horde, uh, Barry Sanders, Bo Jackson, Emmett Smith, Thurman Thomas, OJ Anderson. Who was the guy that you would say, motherfucker, I, I, he just gets away sometimes? I got to play against this guy one time. None of these guys on the list right here that I just said? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying. Right. I got to play against this guy one time. And I remember Barry Sanders. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. I got to play against him twice. One time in a regular season game, another time in the Pro Bowl. And all week long, we've been working on, we got Cordell Stewart being Barry Sanders because Stu was fast. Coach LeBoy said nothing all week long. We're getting ready to come out the tunnel in the Silver Dome. We're getting ready to come out the tunnel. <laughs> Coach LeBoy comes up to me, touches me on my shoulder pad, and says, all right, 95. Just try to keep, uh, keep, keep, uh, what is it, number nine? What is the number? 
Barry Sanders, was, I think he was in the 20s, I think, his number. 20. He may have been number 20. Yeah. He said, hey, hey, let's just try to keep number 20 uh, uh, in, in, in raps today, you know. You know, you know he's going to get his. And I'm looking at him like, well, goddamn, he ain't got no confidence in me. But what he's done, done, what he's done now, he's made all that I've been thinking about. Now it's right here. It's like right here. And so if you've ever seen two dogs fight, one's a fighter and the other one never fought, put your money on the one that's never fought. Because the one that's never fought is scared of shit. And he gonna, he going to do whatever he got to do. And that was me against Barry Sanders. And it was like, Everywhere he went, that's where I was. I kept. T- I told Cardinal Lake. I said, I, you know, it was. I sounded like, and I know Cardinal Lake kept going, man. Shut up. Okay, listen. I'm telling. You, I said, I'm telling. You, I'm taking my shot at. It. I'm not fucking dancing with Barry Sanders today. If Barry Sanders goes outside, stay the fuck outside, because I'm coming from inside, and I'm gonna take my shot from there. And if he jukes me and go outside, you be there. And that was our game plan. But I don't think Barry Sanders had maybe 70, 70 some yards that day. But he's gonna get that. You know. But as long as we held him under 100 yards, remember, he ain't got nobody blocking for him back there. He ain't no fullback to lead you, let you figure out where they're going. It's just him. And you got to figure And most of the day, we play a nickel defense. So I'm the only linebacker on the field. Barry Sanders is my, he's my guy. Mm-hmm. And But mad respect for him. Thurman Thomas, different guy. Thurman and I are good friends. I, all the Buffalo boys, because we went to so many Pro Bowls and done a lot of stuff together. I still play golf with old crazy-ass Bruce Smith. But um, Thurman is funny. Shit talker? Shit talk. Thurman, <laughs> they always come like, we warming up him and Biscuit and all of them come through there, tap me over, what's going on? And Dre Reed and all them boys. And it's cool. We, we, we like, we're, we're cool, but when the game starts, it's like this right here. And so <laughs> I told Thurman when he came and talked to me, I said, hey, I said, I'm going to be babysitting your ass all day today. You know the first words out of his mouth? Fuck you. Hey, fuck, 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 fuck. So I'm tackling Thurman. I'm hitting him. I'm tackling. And I look up at I get his face, man. Thurman going back to the huddle. He go, hey, man, any of you motherfuckers going to block Greg Lord today? Any of you motherfuckers going to block? And I said, hey, I said, hey, when you get ready to get some water on the sideline, I'm going to be handing it to you. Like, yeah. So we did that. So we did this all day long. But just, you know, just good guys. So Dre Reed in the same in the same way, you know. But like I said, other than other than Thurman and like you say, you what the name you did means like Emmett wasn't Emmett wasn't a um what is that? You hit Emmett, 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 Emmett starts tipping. Back then when we hit Emmett, I mean I know he's the Russian whatever, but when you hit Emmett, Emmett starts tipping. We never even had we never had an issue with Emmett. Emmett's there was Emmett had like the best offensive line probably that, that it's ever been put together, you know, with the Dallas Cowboys. And, uh, you know, I can't imagine, well, you know, everybody always says the same thing. I can't imagine if Barry Sanders had that offensive line, what he would have done, how much more he would have done. But was never, never afraid of Emmett. The guy that everybody had to look at, I, I hit Okio, and I call Chris and Okoye not good friends. I call him Okio. Okio and I hit each other on a, on a draw once, and we both gave each other headaches, but we would never say anything. And I remember going back to the huh. <laughs> and my free safety, Thomas Ever was looking at me and Thomas Ever was going, hey, hey, 9-5, you all right? I go, fuck no, I'm not all right. I said, but I ain't going to the sideline, but I got no feelings in my arm, my fingers are tingly and everything, and then you line up, and in your head, all you can think is like, please, Lord, don't let him run play over here, because I got nothing, I got nothing. I got, your arms feel like, you're like a cartoon character, like he's just going around and stuff, but you know, all those guys are good guys, man. They're good backs. It's just on certain days, they're going to get you. They're going to be some games where if you play a guy long enough, he's going to get you. But most days, we like to be in the red. If we're in the red on most days, we're good. You know? Any of the tackles, uh, right tackle, left tackle, any of those guys give you a hard time? My buddy Griff is going to have a good feeling with this one right here. Good. He, 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 he sees he's going to have fun with this. My baptism into the NFL came from Anthony Munoz. Well, Anthony Munoz, the guy from the Bengals? <laughs> the guy from the Bengals. Anthony Munoz, I can guarantee you right now, Anthony Munoz still today is probably the best fucking left tackle that's ever fucking played this game. Shit. Anthony Munoz had me, I promise you, Anthony Munoz, I, I passed with Anthony Munoz, right? 
Andy Munoz had me like this right here. He like, that's how I was. I, I felt like my feet were dangling like this right here and shit. And it was like, it's like he was telling Boomer, like, come on over here. I got, I got him. You know, stuff. The best feet and the best hands of any offensive tackle that I've ever. And I mean, listen, that's not saying anything bad about Rolf. That's not saying anything bad about Ogden or any of those other guys out there. I played against Baselli, not even in the same fucking state, not even in the, on, on the same cloud, not not even nowhere close. This boy right here, Anthony Munoz, and and, and do it and would do it and laugh and be laughing, but he just smiled, and I was like, I can't get around. Best thing ever happened to me was he retired. <laughs> <laughs> But man, you know, I gave him my best, but he was just, and this is some guys like that. Some guys got your, they got your number. He had my number. He had my number. But Greg, what is that? One percent in the league that got your number? Bro, let me tell you something. He was a bad man. I think if you ask anybody, when you start talking about left tackles, if you don't put Anthony, if Anthony Munoz's name is not mentioned first or second, you just stop listening to whoever's talking. Just stop listening to him. So you, you, you I, might as well end the conversation, right? Like, all right, see you. No. Yeah, it's in the conversation. Anthony Munoz, by far. Holy shit. By far. Greg, you know what's a funny story, too, about you? You know, in Georgia, if it snows even a little, everything gets uh, shut down, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> so you're, uh, you're in Pittsburgh, uh, and it's snowing, and the, and the coaches are like, yo, where the fuck are you? He's like, I'm home. <laughs> like, well, what do you mean, home, man? You got to be out here practicing. Tell me I, that hey, story, man. man. That was funny as shit. <laughs> Hey, so, so yeah, like you said, we don't get snow here in Georgia. Of course, playing in Pittsburgh, you get snow. I didn't, I, I had a car at the time until I had the maximum, and the maximum was lowered. And I woke up this morning, this one morning, and it's snow, it's snow everywhere. So I went and got back in the fucking bed. And I woke up and looked out the window, so I went and got back in the bed. So sometime later, and and I should have known better, but I didn't, because you know, you know, this is part of part of the learning process. But my phone rang, and it was, uh, uh, I'm seeing his face right now. He was our trainer, and I can't call his name. Rap Berlin, sorry, Rap Berlin. And Rap Berlin was one of the funniest guys you you, you know, man. He was funny as shit. He didn't mean a lot, but he had, he had a mouth on him out of his world. So first words out of his mouth were, I go, hello. He go, hey, bitch. <laughs> That's the first word. <laughs> hey, bitch. And I was like, okay. And I go, what's up? He goes, uh, where are you? I said, where'd you call? He said, you better get your black ass over here. And they said, just like that. He said, you better get your black ass over here. He said, we fucking, he said, we fucking work when it's snowing around here. He said, hey, and by the way, before you come see me, go by and see Coach Snow. And I was like, oh, shit. You, you, that's you're afraid it, of the pink slip, right? The pink slip? That's, <laughs> that's, that's, when, that's when it got real. That's when it got real. And so now... I don't know how to drive in the snow. At that point, I was living in the Allegheny Center, and the Allegheny Center was probably about, I said half a mile, half a mile to the stadium. It's like if you went underneath the underpass and stuff right there from the stadium, you came underneath the underpass, Allegheny Center was kind of right there. So I got to walking. Now, mind you, I ain't been in Pittsburgh that long. I don't know nothing about wet snow and tennis shoes. That's enough said, right? So you're wearing sneakers? So I, hey, bro, I ain't got no boots. I ain't had snow. I ain't got no boots. So I got my sneakers on. And I don't walk in the snow. I don't walk underneath there trying not to slip and everything. So I get to the stadium and I shake my shoes. I remember my feet are freaking freezing. My shoes are covered. So I come through the front door, which I normally never come through. I used to always come through the back door. And Connie, God rest her soul, too, was, was uh, Coach Noel's, uh secretary. And Connie looks at me and she just shakes her head. And I go, like they make, you know, and, and now it's like the closer I'm getting, this thing is, this thing is like it's something like, oh shit. So I'm going, I like almost like a little kid. I'm going, uh, 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 Coach Lowe wants to see me. I said it so low. And kind of go, mm hmm. And I go, oh shit. So I go, you want to see me right now? She said, yeah. So I walk around. Like his office is right there. But I walk around. <laughs> the long way to get to him and when I get there he's like like I am at my computer he's like I'm behind and he's looking this way right here and I just barely knocked on the door 
I'm like, Coach. And he turns around, and he ain't got that smile that you're showing right there on his face. He's just kind of like, just looking kind of, you know, emperorish. Mm -hmm. And so then he cracks a little bit of a grin, and he goes, uh, he goes, uh, uh, Greg, he says, uh, probably once in every five or six years, he said, we, we draft some guys out of, out of, out of uh, South Georgia. And he said, uh, they've never seen no snow. And he says, um, I want you to know that uh, when it snows around here, you know, we practice. He said, we practice and uh, we show up. He said, and then he got, then he kind of started getting a little grid on his face. And he go, uh, let that, let that be your last time. And I went, yes, sir. And, and so I'm thinking like, can I go? I wouldn't say it. I was like, can I go? I just want, I just, I just like, can I go? And I was like, uh, yes, sir. And he goes, uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of vehicle do you have? I said, uh, I have a car. He said, you might want to get you a truck. He said, because this is that time of the year. So he's giving me all this information. So in my, in, in my, 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 my alter ego inside is going, yeah, I'm still here. Like, yeah, because he's giving me too much information. Other than that, he would have been like, yeah, oh God. So I go back there. Of course, now, that's the easy part. I got to go face the boys and this fucking rap Berlin. And I go back there and they're going, oh, this fucker here. Look at this fucker here. He just getting in talking. He was and so everybody's giving me shit. And I go, okay, 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 I got it. 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 Don't have me again. So I go to Tony Parisi and I go, hey, I need a truck. And Tony hooked me up with, with, with a guy. And I, I got rid of my car and got a truck. It never happened to me again. Never happened to me again. I told him, I said, listen, man, we in Georgia, it snows. You know that. You know you ain't going outside. It, it, ain't nobody working. Ain't nobody doing nothing. You just go, you get up in the morning, you go sit in front of the television or the radio, and you listen to what's open and what's not open and who don't fell off that coast. You, you, you just, we don't have the means. We don't have trucks with salt and stuff to scrape the roads around here. You stay your ass home. And that's what I did. And that was my quick lesson in snow. And I learned to enjoy. I learned to love to play in snow. I actually did. Wow. That's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, but could have got me out of there. If I wasn't if I wasn't a good player. Oh, you've been probably, gone. Could have got me out of there. Probably got me out of there. Oh, you had the potential. I don't even think I was who 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 everybody think I was. I don't think I had that status at that time. But I think I had the potential. And I think that's what kept me there. Absolutely. Greg, let me ask you this. Like, you know, when you're you're a star in Pittsburgh, right? And you walk around the streets, could could you walk? I mean, Pittsburgh is really a small city. Well, like now I can. I probably can now. People would still probably notice you, but no, I can't. No, no, I'm now. talking about when you played. I played absolutely not. You couldn't go I, anywhere, right? I, I I have been I put it like this. I went to get my wife and kids from the airport. They were coming in for a game, and I had my two my two oldest. I had my my son was holding my hand, and my daughter, I had her in my in her arms, you know, carrying her, and my son was holding my hand. And we was coming, you know. I went down to the gate. That was before all this other stuff. You can almost go on the plane. So I went down and got them and and everything. And 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 um, I was coming out, and guy walked. I was like, oh shit, Greg Lord. And he goes, hey Greg, can you, can you sign can you sign something for me? And I go, okay. Uh well, you want me to you want me to let you hold my daughter while I sign that? Or what? And I go, hey man, I say, I say, I, I get it. I said, I get it. I said, but another time. I said, another time. You know, little, little stuff like that. But then again, you know, you sit down in the restaurant, you're eating. And I used to always have to tell my wife, I said, you're gonna have to do this because if I do it, I'm gonna come across as a hole. I said, if somebody comes over here, people come over here while we're trying to eat, you're going to have to be the one to say, hey, guys, this lady needs food, and then he may sign it afterwards. But it's like, if your steak dinner costs you $75 and mine costs me $75, you get to eat yours hot, I get to eat mine cold, I'm pissed. And it's like, you know, there's a time and a place. So I told my wife, I said, you have to tell people, he's enjoying his family, let him enjoy his family. Because if I open my mouth to say no, I'm with my... Then you go like, oh, I saw Great Lord the restaurant, you asshole. He went, I said, I, I can't win. That's a no win, it's a no win situation for me. So you have to be not so much the bad guy, but you have to be the person that says it because they know that if they say something stupid to you, then they don't have to deal with me. 
and and then you know it's like that so so that was that but i i was never one to i'm i'm private i was private then and i'm super super private now but i'm 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 the guy like i don't want to be walking down that square or down at the point i don't want to be the guy walking through the mall just to be walking through the mall i don't want to be seen i don't want that as, I, I, as much time as I could be away from people and away from football, I want to enjoy that solitude. Because, you know, it's like, they, you know, you got access to it. You got sex to almost our whole life. So some parts of you got to be private. You got to have some parts of you that you just like private. You know, I mean, yeah, we, we, we you know, we can run to the mall to pick up, you know, you know, if you've got a coat or a suit or something for the wife or the kids, something like that. And, you know, you try to get out of there real fast. But, but, um back then but um now a lot easier because you've been out of game for a while and i live in atlanta people who know football know football. the county the other day i was at cigar bar the other day the guy walks in he looks at me he looks at me again he walks past me goes out to the car he come back he says hey you're michael lord aren't you i go no <laughs> he goes no man he said you're not Michael Lord that played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I said I am not Michael Lord that played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now my buddy, who owns a cigar shop, I gave him a jersey and his sign. It's like right behind me, mm -hmm. and he's looking at the jersey. He's looking at me. He's looking at the jersey. He said, "Man, you are Michael Lord." I said, "Hey, bro." I said, "I'm gonna say this to you." I said, "You a Steelers fan?" He said, "Yeah, I'm a Steelers." I said, "You couldn't possibly be a Steelers fan." He said, "Why you say that, man?" I said, "Because you keep calling me Michael, and that's not my name." I said, now that jersey behind me, it belongs to me. I said, but Michael is not my name. So little stuff like that. We got a cool cat, but I was just like, you know, he, he was just a little off there. But yeah, little, little, little moments like that when it's like, it's intimate. It's only like two or three people. Cool. Cool as cat, you know, and right. stuff like that. Take a picture with him. But I don't want to go. It's like the Falcons played Steelers last night. And we played golf yesterday. And the boy was like, are you going to the game tonight? I go. Fuck no, I'm not going to the game. I said, first of all, if I'm going to the Steelers game, I would have talked to Mike T or somebody up in the front office. Well, I'm not going to be sitting out there with everybody else. I'm going to be wherever, wherever, you know, Mr. Rooney and all of them going to be sitting there. That's where I want to be. You know, or I'm going to get sideline pass going out. I'm fucking going to go sit up in the stands with a bunch of idiots. I'm not going to do that, you know. Uh, so I, was like, I stay away from that kind of stuff. I don't want, I don't want, I don't want any part of that. I come to PA. And people go, great, you come back to P. I come to P. Most of the time I come back to Pennsylvania, it's for a martial arts instructor. I come back to PA, play golf with him, or sit in on black belt testing or something like that, but not football. Not football, not at all. Is it because you don't love it anymore, or what is it? It's not so much the love of the game. It's just that, like you said, I watch this game. I watch the defense that they're playing. I believe black and gold, bro. Don't get me wrong. Still is going to always be my team, I will never talk to you. You hear me talking, you go back and look at this, you're going to always see. I think the Rooney's and their family have, have have made this team one of the, one of, if not the most stocky uh, 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 legacy teams in the league. I think it's the team, it's the, it's the, it's the thing that everybody wants to be like. That For that, I'm very grateful to have been a part of that. But at the same time, the game of football has changed. The game of football has become more about money and how many hits you got on this tube and who's got more hits, who's making the most money. And it's like, okay, well, a lot of that came in on our shoulders. In 1987, we were the guys who went on strike so that you guys could get this rate so you can have the money that you have. But the game has changed and you guys aren't playing the game the way we play it. You're not playing it with sincerity. You're playing it for money. You're not playing it for legacy. You're playing it for money. You know? I mean, it's like, I would have played a long time ago. If they had had a thing that said, listen, for one year, y'all going to play for free. I would have played, fuck yeah. That's how much I love the game. Yeah, fuck yeah. I'll play for you. As long as y'all, if you guys cover my insurance and shit, I'll play that bitch for free. I'll show up every fucking practice. I'll play for free. That's how much you love the game. You don't have a guy in the league right now that would say some shit like that. No. You, don't have, you don't have a guy that would say that, you know? And so it's, 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 it's different because, you know, 
so many different entities have gotten involved and put that NFL label on it. NFL can no longer because of collective bargaining agreement. The owners can't keep that money to themselves, so the money has to be properly dispersed. If you think about this, long years and years ago, there was guys at the bottom, then there was a the middle guy, then there was a the top guy. The middle guy's getting eliminated now. You know, the guy that was making four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars, he was the middle guy. That's got really guy got the mean salary before long is gonna be like a million dollars. You know, the, just, is that minimum wage right now? That's gonna almost soon sooner or later, that's gonna be the minimum that's gonna be the minimum. It's gonna be a million bucks. And so it's like, you know, like I said, back in the day you used to see that commercial where the Marines used to say, Many are called but few are chosen. It's not the same anymore. You know, I, I used to think that way about the league, but it's not the same anymore. And if I can say this without somebody, you know, getting whatever, but I've never seen that many white wide receivers in my life. I've never seen that many. You know, I'm not saying it to be whatever, but the game has changed because they they, they, they they can't get hit no more. So that's that's what they're doing. It's like everybody's fast and it's like it's like Cooper Cup and Elderman and all these guys, that's what I wasn't gonna say at the beginning of the thing, but these motherfuckers would have been in traction, bro. Right. They would have been in traction if they playing with us. You know, I'm just calling it what it is. I mean, in that era, they were good. But they would have been in traction yeah. if they played. There's no way in the fuck you could run across the middle and catch a ball and you don't get your fucking bell wrong playing with us. You may do it one time, but you ain't going to do it all game. Right. So the yeah. machines, man. And it's like you're seeing a lot more, a lot different game. And I, and I say I, I just don't. I, like I said, I think the integrity of the game with the coaches that are there, I, I mean, hats off to the coaches that are trying to keep a team together with all the crap that they have to deal with. I mean, you know, you know, like I said, nobody knew what Coach Coach uh, Mike T was going through with A.B. until they saw A.B., you know, the real A.B. and what he was doing. You know, we pray to God that he's getting some help wherever he is. But nobody knew what Mike T was going through. Everybody was like, you know, whatever. Then when he went other places and started doing what he was doing, they go, Mike T was putting up with that. Oh my gosh, you know, and to be able to keep his laurels about himself and everything. But I mean, you know, it's it's a different game, man. It's a it's a me, it's kind of a, you know, everybody and everything is with the exception, I guess, the the, the, the organization, but everybody it's about me. Yeah. It's about me. You know, it's you know, about Greg, me. the way you hit quarterbacks, if it was now, you would probably get ejected every game. I'd be ejected. And then not only that, not only that. When I retired, I would probably they would probably be sending me shit saying you still owe money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> did you, you know? Did you take any quarterback lightly, like Dan Marino? Did you? I mean, did like, or you just said no? I'm gonna kill every quarterback. Well, first of all, like I said, when I first came to Pittsburgh, I tell you what gave me it rubbed me wrong with quarterbacks. My own, our own quarterback, you can call him that, Mark Malone. Was court was 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 still a quarterback, but Mark, you know what I thought was, if you're a quarterback and you considered the leader of the team, you're the voice of the team, so you're the guy that everybody. And this guy, he didn't talk to anybody. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't break bread with anybody. He didn't. He wasn't even courteous to you. If you weren't Ouija Thompson or or, or, or at that time Stallworth or, or Lewis Lips. He didn't talk to you. And I thought that was shitty. So, I again, I, when I told people I didn't like my own fucking quarterback, I was serious about it. So, I was like, he's an asshole. And I was like, if I had the opportunity to practice in his ass, I probably would have. So, so my thing of it is when I, when I started playing, man, it was like, listen, first of all, these guys are making the most money. And do you remember, I don't know if you remember, when they tried to separate all of them from everybody else and they started that bullshit quarterback club? Mm -hmm. Start paying these guys all the money and everybody else get. I said that's bullshit. You can't. Do. So that's that 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 set me off another. So my thing was it didn't matter if you was a quarterback or you know if it was your first year, your fifteenth year. If I got a chance to put a lick on you, man, I'm gonna put a lick on. I asked every guy that was a linebacker that was a friend of mine, if you get a chance to hit my quarterback and you can take him out, you know they were his word. They didn't even hesitate. Fuck yeah, I'm gonna take him out. So I didn't feel bad about what I was doing. And it was like, you know, if these guys feel the same way when they get to my quarterback and they can take him out, I, ha I have to feel the same way. I have to have that same thing. The thing of it, I'm not trying to end his career or get him hurt, but if he gets hurt in the process, that's the risk he took when he signed the line. He signed on the line. 
That's the risk we all take when we sign the contract. Yeah. That you're gonna probably get hurt. You know, that you're gonna probably have some issues. So let's not make a rule where it favors a guy that's already fucking making twenty times more money than everybody, and now you're gonna make a rule to protect his ass. So you think when I get back there, I'm gonna go back there and smack him on his ass and tell him how sweet he smells? <laughs> there you go. You know, so that's that's the deal. You know, <laughs> making. Make him feel some of that pain I've been feeling all, all fucking week, right, right. you know. But that's that's part of it, man. But no, I I I I, um, I had no I had no prejudices against anybody. I didn't dislike anybody. But for sixty minutes, I I you weren't my friend. For sixty minutes, you were the enemy, regardless. But you know how right now you see before the game, the opponents are talking with each other, like you know, like they're friends and shit. That wasn't you guys didn't do that in your days, right? Absolutely not. I tell you, I, when I said to you earlier, we'd be like, like, like in Three River Stadium, the visiting home team, I mean, the visiting team would always come out of that tunnel right there. And that's where we warmed up at. So when they came out the tunnel, but all Buffalo guys, all the guys I hung out with, Biscuit, uh, 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 Dre Reed, you know, uh, 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 Bruce, and T Thurman Tom, they would always find me. And come over there, tap me. What's up, bro? What's up? What's up? Okay. And I'm like, hey man, have a good game, have a good game, have a good game. But it's like it's right here. I mean, they were they were always, you know, so when the game start, it was like they my boys, but I had to tell I had to tell Dre Reed, I said about Dre, but I had to tell Dre Reed. Kelly kept throwing him these little quick fucking passes across the bed, and I and I was tackling him. Hence the word tackle. I was tackling him. And Dre would get up and I'd go, hey man, you better tell Keller quick throwing you this shit across the middle. I said, cause see, I ain't hit your ass yet. You know, and I'm tackling him because I know his wife, I know his kids, we hang out together. But then my boy is gonna be looking at me like, mm hmm if that was Don BB, you'd be knocking his ass out. Why aren't you knocking Dre? So I'm giving him a warning. So go back. Throw the pass there next time. Yak it. And he go, God damn, man. I said, I told you. I told you. I said, I told you. I said, now, you can keep running your ass across here and keep getting hit like that. Or you can run you some long routes. I said, because you keep coming here, I'm going to mock shit at you. And when we get done, he going to go, man, God damn G Lord. He hit. I said, no, you kept running the fucking route. And then what you think I'm going to do? So that's that's how it worked, man. So we, you know, we talk. And then I, I, uh, a good friend of mine, Terrence Mathers, and how Terrence goes. He said, man, he said, I tried to talk to you before the game and everything, you know. And I said, I thought we was boys. He said, man, you wouldn't even, he said, he didn't tell people, he said, you know, wouldn't even talk to me. I said, bro, I was, I'm in game mode. I said, I'm in game mode. But no, I, I, I can't do it. I mean, you know, I would tell people like this right here, man. And I know some other people said it's part of cliche. I said, if that was my brother, sister, mama, cousin on the other side of the ball and they catch that ball. I said, you better pray. I'm not coming over there. I said, because I'm coming over there. I'm going to lay your ass out. And they go, for real? I'm like, yeah, you ain't got the same jersey I got on. That shit don't mean nothing. You know, when we trying to get the difference between a W and a L, and I got to knock mama out. Mama going to get knocked out. Period. You know, Greg, I'll tell you one thing, man. I, you know, when I was hanging out with you at the golf course in Nashville, you know, to get to know you, and I said to myself, I wish a lot of people had your mentality, not just in football, but in life, man. Yeah. You know, you like the, the discipline, you know, you got to have discipline to be where you are, you know? Absolutely. And Absolutely. it's like, why? what's your take on this before I let you go, Greg? Why do people don't have that discipline just in life? Forget about the game. Well, I think... Why, what's your opinion on that? I, I, think, I think a lot of people come out of the room trying to be entitled. We, we're dealing with a lot of entitlement today. It's easy for somebody who wants to do what you're doing. Forget me. If somebody who's in, in social media now and they say, they watch this and they go, hey, that guy, Eddie, he can do that. I can do that. But they don't know what you had to do. They don't know what you had to go through. They don't know the sacrifices you had to make. They want to come from here all the way down here by my shoes and jump in your seat and jump right in your seat. They don't want to have to go through dealing with all the other stuff that you can sit down and tell them about what they have to do to make sure they do that. And I think it's the same in life with, um, you know, kids go, what do you want to do when you grow up? Well, I want to do it. Why? 
you know, because I want to have this and I want to have that. And it's like, but do you understand the sacrifices? See, nobody, nobody in my class, in my high school class and other class, understood that when I when I was playing high school football, coaches said I want I want to go on vacation with my family, but we was having these little freaking practices, and they were like, well, if you don't make these practices, you can't be captain. So I got to go home now and tell my auntie that I can't go on this vacation because if I go on this vacation, then I'm not going to be captain of the football team. Now, she doesn't understand that. All she knows is that, what the hell are you talking about? I can't leave you here in this house by yourself and, you know, I'm going to have somebody look after you and all that. You go, And I'm thinking to myself, I got to do this to, to be captain. So sacrifices. Nobody's willing to make and put in the work and do the sacrifice. And again, it goes back to what I'm saying. Fucking work hard now so you can play hard later. Everybody wants to do the opposite of that. Everybody wants to play hard and then work it and even got to, you know, ain't even in the, ain't even in the plan. So I think if, if, if we in America start teaching our kids and we start showing kids the process as opposed to giving them a, a uh, dummies book on, you know, what's, what's the, how they do, they give them that, the, 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 the dummies book on how to do something. It's like, give them the big book so they can read it. Don't give them the footnotes. Show them, you know, and, and, and tell them that, you know, life's a, life's, a, life's a marathon. It's not a sprint, you know. Don't be afraid to take the long route. Don't be afraid to take it easy and take it easy and take it easy and find out more about yourself. Find out about more of what you can do and find out how. Go out to dinner with somebody that you want to be like. Find out and pick their brains about stuff like that. You can probably ask a bunch of guys right now that are playing football. I want to be like Barry Sanders. Like, call Barry Sanders up. I'm pretty sure he got people. And go have a, you know, I mean, he's at that point. Where he said, go sit down and have a conversation with him. Buy him some lunch and buy him some breakfast. Pick his mind on what he did. Because if you want to be like those people, find out what they did. What was it that you did? And you'll find out that the things that you're doing and the things that they did is that much different. And the difference is that whatever Eddie is willing to do that Greg's not willing to do, you're going to be that much more successful than me. And whatever I'm willing to do that another person's not willing to do, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be more successful. And people tend to lean toward people who are successful. Not so much successful in their own right, but people who have a sense of of others right. and love. You know, I mean, we do it. And we do it. We do it with a concern for others and love. And, and I say this real quick, and I know we've been this way, but we go. You know, the Bible has two. The first two greatest commandments are. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and love others. Love thy neighbors. And we don't do that anymore. With all the stupid stuff that you see posted online, it's, it's most of the time, it's, it's selfish. You know, I like the funny stuff. I look at it every once and again, the funny stuff. But we don't laugh anymore, man. You know, it's like go to bed. Let the last thing you watch your television before you go to bed at night. Let it be something funny because it puts you in the mood. Greet somebody. Say hi. You ain't got to have the gas face and, you know, trying to be alpha males. And, you know, I ain't talking to you. You ain't talking to me. It's like, hey, man, I love you. you I know who you are. You, if you're not a son or a daughter of God, you know, then, you know, let me tell you a little bit about it. Because all this other stuff at the end of the day, Ed, what you're doing right now, when we get to heaven, God doesn't care about that. You know what he cares about? He cares about how you treated Greg Lloyd. He cares about how you treated your mom, how you treated people that care. That's what he cares about. He don't care about none of this stuff. So all this football stuff, that's great. But at the end of the day, the man upstairs is who we have to answer to. I don't have to answer to nobody else. I can be respectful of your opinions. I can be respectful of a lot of stuff. But I don't have to answer to nobody but the Lord, you know, the Lord my Savior. And all he's going to ever ask me how did you treat other people? Did you love them? You know? Yeah. And so I can't go back and undo stuff that I said and did and bad relationships and stuff like that. But I can ask for forgiveness. You know? And I can forgive myself. And once I've done that and I know that I'm in a good place with him, that's all that matters. So when our kids get that, I think that's what's, that's what's happened to our, 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 our culture now. We've taken God out of everything. We've taken them out of everything. We got more people pissed off about a freaking flag than we do about 
our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If we got people that will be upset about God like they upset about this American flag, oh man, we're going to be a great nation. We'll be, we'll be a much greater nation. But we got people upset about a dang flag. I ain't going to fly a flag. Just because you wear a flag that make you more patriotic than me. You know, you got flags all over your house. It doesn't because all of that stuff is here. You know, you all that's and just like you said, you can't measure that. You can't measure all that stuff is here. You know, and anybody that's like you know, that's like they're guys who won Super Bowl rings and they never wear them. Why? Because they know they they know what they did. Then there's guys who wear them that was on the team. You never fucking heard of him. Joe Joe Butt fuck. Excuse me for for saying, but he just Joe Joe whoever, and he's got his ring on. You go, you play? He said, "What's your name?" So if I got to ask you your name, you were just on the team. I get it. You got a Super Bowl ring. But the guys that played it and went in there and mattered and started and did something, they don't have to wear them because you know who he is and you know what you know what you know the work they put in. So that's the difference, man. We're every it's like we are such a we we become such a me 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 nation. My thing would be again to most kids. It would be an, a, a, anybody. It would be you know. Consider others, you know, work hard, do your best, don't leave a stone unturned, find people that are in, in, in the thing that you're in, talk to the best people that are in there, and keep keep knocking down doors, keep knocking down doors, don't let a ceiling, if there's a ceiling man, you, 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 you cut a hole in it and make you a, a, a skylight, and keep it moving, you know, but don't let anybody tell you that you can't do something. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't accomplish something. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't become something. But in all of that, you got to love your neighbor. Love yourself. Love your neighbor. Love the Lord thy God first before everything. And put him first in everything that we do. And when we do that, man, everything else kind of takes care of itself. You know? You know, Greg, when I got I got to know you that night, we were at the Cigar Lounge in Nashville the night before golfing. Right, right. I remember. And I said to myself, you know, he reminds me of me, the mentality. Like, for instance, I'll give you an example. When I went to acting school, two-year program, intense, my acting teacher told me, and he had your mentality too, like as far as working hard, you know, school is full-time, right? And you do the three hours of acting, but I would stay longer and figure out more stuff. It's the same thing right. with you practicing. If you would practice for three hours, you would stay an extra half hour, Right. To, to get more work done. And that when I read that from you, I said to myself, I have to get this guy on my podcast. I have to. And I'm not the type of guy like just because you're an athlete, this and that. Okay, let me get him. I read the person first. I'm like, all right, let me know. Let me get to know this guy. Right, right. You know? And if you look at my uh, guess, it's that play to win attitude, but not just in sports, in all life. The time. All the time, all the time. It's like I, I go off with my buddies now. I'm a sore loser. They'll tell you that right off. I'm a sore loser. I'm a, I'm a sore loser, but guess what? I'm going to go put the time in so that when I get ready to go play golf with them, I can make it no excuses that I haven't played golf. If I don't play bad, if I don't play well, it ain't because I didn't go out and practice because you guys were better than me. But I'm going to go out there and I'm going to put in the time that I can put in when I'm home. I'm going to put that time in. And when I get to you, I'm hoping you didn't. I'm hoping you didn't put that time in. And then that's when that's when you see number 95 in a in golf outfit. And he's there talking. You, go. you, see, you see that outfit right there? Yeah, there it is. There it is. Yeah. But yeah. But it's but it, I mean it's fun. But I at think the same this time, is my favorite one right here. Look at that. With the cigar, it tells a story right there. Oh, that's right. That's what it's all about. But it's, <laughs> but at the same time, you you're still competitive. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm still. And it's but like, you know, I don't hold, hold on a minute, Greg. You took those guys lightly when we were there. I mean, I was with you on the cart for five hours, man. You were like, Eddie, <laughs> I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be calm with these guys. <laughs> then, <laughs> right? Then, then, because again, I didn't. You don't want to. I, I put it like this. I was playing with these guys, and it's like. I'm going to let them set the tone. Mm -hmm. you, you feel me? I'm going to let them set the tone. And you, know, and you think about it. Some of those guys were horrible. Right? I didn't say anything. You know? And I, I just like, hey, listen. They paid their money. They come out here. Let's just have a good time. If I can tell some stories and stuff like that, that's all I want to be. I want to be a good experience. 
in spite of bad golf and let it be a good experience and have some fun. And every once and again, you know, I throw a little poke in there and about, you know, golf game and stuff like this right here. But it's just to have fun because at the end of the day, I don't want a guy to go back and say, I played golf with Greg Lloyd, man. He was such an asshole. He talked about, no, I don't want that to be. I want, I want, it, 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 if I get invited somewhere and they say, hey, listen, Greg, you're going to be playing with a bunch of guys, my thing is always, I let them set the tone. It's like, hey, listen, go ahead and hit, man. Don't worry about it. You know, and it's like, I can pick my ball up and say, hey, listen, let's play that one right there. Let's do it. Just to make a guy play. That's what it's about. It ain't about me. Right. It ain't about and, and that's what I read. That's what I read about you. Yeah. It's not about me. It's like, hey, listen, you want to ask me perfect scenario to ask me questions about football. We on this. We're going to be out here for five hours. You ask me about football. That's great. You know, and stuff like that. And I answer your question to the best of my ability. But let's have some fun. You know, yeah. we're gonna smoke a cigar. We may we, have a. We, we, but we were, we were shooting the shit, man. We were in the golf cart, just shooting the that's shit. What, we were just shooting shit. And that's what we do, man. And when I get with my boys, that's what we do. You know what we talk about, man? We talk about old time playing stuff that we did. But most of it is not about football games, it's about shit we did outside of football. Mm -hmm. You know? You remember when we went there? Yeah, hey, man, you remember when we did this? You remember when we was hanging out and you got this? And you remember, oh, you remember when we had to get old boy out the pad? Stuff like that. That's what we That's what we talk about. It ain't football. And, I, you know, I, I just mess with Bruce just to mess with Bruce. We talk about Bruce Smith. I just mess with him, mess with him every once in a year. And he was like, hey, man, I remember when y'all came down, you know, to, to play us. And, you know, because when we, when we first started getting really good, you know, Buffalo was the team to beat. Oh, yeah. You know, four Super Bowls in a row. Four years in a row, yeah. Is, and people don't get this. A lot of people don't get this. Man, listen, that ain't that's a feat, bro. That's a feat. Because think about it. Was it only two teams that they played twice? Was it only one team they played twice? Yeah, they played was back it? to back. No, they played four years in a row. They went to the Super Bowl. No, but I'm saying of the teams that were their opponents, I know the Cowboys. Was it the Patriots? No, not the Patriots back then. Not the Patriots. Was it the Cowboys? But I'm trying to think. Were there no, 90, two, the first was there one team in there that played them twice? Yes, I think I think it was the Cowboys. I think. I I'm think. thinking it may, I think it may have because been the Cowboys. Because the first year it was the Giants when Norwood missed the field goal. I remember. It was the Giants. And then you have the uh, one where they lost to the big one where they lost to the uh, they lose the 49ers? No, that was uh, that was the Chargers. That was the 49ers. Who was it? See, that's how much I, I know about. Yeah, but I but my thing about it is that there was no other team in the NFL that went to four in Super Bowls just like that right there. And people don't realize how much of a feat that was. And for that reason, for that reason, I get mad respect for him, but I can play golf with him and tell him, go fuck himself. <laughs> I love it, baby. I love it. <laughs> He's my dog, but I can play golf with and tell him call him a black sob and and we cool you know like but 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 here if i'm somewhere and i hear somebody say something about bruce and about something they said they're gonna have to deal with me ah uh, bruce smith is no joking though and if you could do me that he, solid you could say hey but, i got my boy eddie ma to get on his podcast but, but like i'm this. saying but i'm <laughs> they gonna have to they gonna have to deal with me but yeah. but but again you see, man, just great guys, man. Just great guys, great fun. And that's what we had that day. And every time I get ready to go, I have to go somewhere like that, man. That's what I want to be. I want to be fun for the people that I'm with. Because I get to learn, too. I mean, you know, they, I, I, like these people that, that, that are playing and paying money to come play, they're not, they're not push over. These people have, they have lives, they have stuff. And it's like, it's not that I'm not interested in what they do. It's like, I can't remember names that well. And so if I see them again, if I see them again, they will go, hey, Greg, you remember me from last year? And I got to sit there and go, oh, holy shit. And then I'm looking at them go, I remember your face, but I remember Greg, you know what you, you got to say? Say, listen, I'm a football player, man. I took hits. So uh, remind uh, me of your name. That's all. Uh, <laughs> That's you the best legitimate. If you told me that, if you yeah, told me I that as here. a human being, I'd be like, you know what? Yeah. You're right. <laughs> I sit here for five minutes and we, we talk or two minutes and I go, I say a name, and then I'm going on. But at the same time, I'm thinking, like, what the hell was that name while I'm talking? And then it'll come back to me. But it's like, you know, that's the way it is these days, man. But, uh, man, life is great, man. Like I said, I, I am um, I, I'm honored, man, that you you thought enough of me to bring me on this show, and I really appreciate it. No, I had to. And, um, you know, John Anthony and Lawrence Davis, you know, that we were hanging out with that. We brought you. Yeah.
Yeah. You know, yeah. They, they spoke highly of you and they said, Eddie, oh, yeah. this guy is legit. Now, you know, when I was looking at the films, I mean, you know, on YouTube, I said, oh, now I remember it because you know, I was way young back then. So I was like, oh, I remember that guy in the Steelers now, 95, you know, and then everybody, boom. Everybody remember the face mask. Everybody talking about you had this big, big face mask. And I, I go, think your shoulder yeah. pads are way bigger too, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, they wear. They wear. I don't know what they wear now, but you see these these shoulder pads look like they get them from Dick's Morton. <laughs> the shoulder pads they wear now, but I mean that's 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 just to get advantage of Patrick, and I understand it. But yeah, back then we were, we were doing some serious hitting, so you had to have some serious stuff on, man. So it was cool. But Eddie, man, listen. you got man. I listen. I I, I third of I'm glad we got together. I I kept looking for that email for the thing, and I kept going. Okay, I don't see it. I don't see it, but uh, hey, listen, man, we pulled it off. No, we pulled it off. Now, listen, let me let me just end this real quick, and I just I need a couple favors real quick. That's all. Um, yeah. okay. There you go. Greg Lloyd, the legend, the man, should be in the Hall of Fame, but who gives a fuck? He put up numbers, and he did it all. He gave his whole heart, his pulmonary artery, his right ventricle. He did it all for the Steelers. All right. <laughs>